All right, good afternoon. Thank you guys for your, and ladies, for your attendance. Uh, there's actually more of you than I thought would show up, so thank you. Uh, very quickly, because I know two people asked me before, I'm, I've set a timer, so I'm going to keep this thing under two hours. You're like, two hours? But as many of you know, a lot of these elements we're going to talk about are, uh, for example, let's take uh, cosmology. In some of these little breakout sessions or workshops, I might spend the entire afternoon just talking about different cosmologies, different cosmogonies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or, of course, history, much more so. So this is going to be fast and furious, I guess. Uh, so bear with me. Some of these topics, uh, I know there's probably some skeptics uh, in the, or some naturalists maybe, even in the audience. So you may say, well, he blew right through that. One of the things I'm trying to fine tune a little bit better here, like that word fine tuning, is really these presentations make them much more condensed. And then I'm here all afternoon. Let's hang out. Let's go over to the library. Let's walk through your campus. Then we can really hone in on those specifics instead of boring probably the greater majority of you to tears. So really quickly, first part's introduction. Logosassociate.org associates is my uh, actual website. The bigger branch of the over 50 scientists, historians, mathematicians, uh, pretty much all the above, geologists, everybody, is logosresearchassociates.org, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but a lot of this stuff that I'm going to blow through very quickly on the logosassociates.org, my site, I have everything bucketed uh, in different areas so, we, so you can get a lot more details, uh, further reading, further information, et cetera, et cetera, as well as contact information for me as well. All right, really quickly, we're going to kind of, you know, Christian, religion, a lot of these have a lot of baggage. Uh, so we're going to kind of step back for a minute. This isn't just, you know, an attempt for me, an attempt by me to twist your arm to believe like I do. Transparency. It's kind of a big deal. I am very transparent, sometimes brutally so. So I usually will kind of frustrate the Christian as well as the non-Christian. Uh, not my intent, but I do think we have to be strategic or uh, transparent the entire time. Uh, healing power of confession. Right before we get started, I do apologize uh, on behalf of myself, on behalf of other Christians. Uh, if you've been offended or hurt by a church, uh, we are all fallen. We are all hypocrites. So, but I do apologize, whether it be from the Crusades, whether it be me offending someone this afternoon unintentionally. I do apologize, and uh, and that's something I think that Christians probably should do more of. All right, so now we're going to talk about art history. Just kidding. No, very quick parallel. My wife and I, uh, she runs a coffee shop, and there's an art gallery underneath it. And I just like using this example just to show how you can kind of, everybody's got their own presuppositions, and you can kind of see we're going to be talking about naturalism and Christianity specifically, and you're going to be able to see that both of those, uh, good or bad, Everything usually has an outworking of that worldview, and art's no different. When you look back at, let's say, the Renaissance, you got your, you know, your plane of sight. Most of us probably learned that in art. We then see uh, uh, Raphael's famous School of Athens. You've got Plato on the left pointing up to say that he finds basically his universals in God or gods. Uh, Aristotle, hand out, no, no, we find it here down on earth. So even whether it be a, a Lawrence Krauss or a Michelangelo uh, or a Raphael, everybody is going to have those worldviews built into them. Again, you can look at this painting and say, it's a side of beef, what's the big deal? Well, you start peeling back the layers. Uh, it was painted by Rembrandt, and basically... Post-Reformation, you've kind of got this uh, like this Baroque period, uh, and he then was so impressed by his view of God that he could look at a side of beef and actually uh, find uh, pleasure, find find a creativity, find the fact that the 
the butcher who made it, uh, you know, is just as important as a king or queen, which a lot of times was what had been painted before. Again, you get into the Enlightenment. Oh, what do we got here? And you can start reading things in. Uh, Socrates uh, taking the, the hemlock poison instead of giving in. You move past the Enlightenment. Romanticism, where it's like nature, the, the Hudson River School, uh, you know, nature is soaking all that in. You get into the 20th century, uh, you run into, uh, I think it's Cezanne, uh, woman in a blue hat, and it, you know, just completely uh, caused riots in the art world because he took something to a different level. Now, a lot of the 20th century, when you're following World War I, and the, obviously the generation between World War I and World War II, the lost generation, like Hemingway, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, they were no different to where societies broke. You also see the whole, uh, uh, a rebellion from church, or, or the church, and it was almost a divorce from the church, and God was just associated with the church. They never thought, keep God, well then you don't necessarily need religion, just be, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, Munch on the scream, uh, Pollock, this is a great example. Painting and art by chance. By chance, why? Well, because, uh, as he explained, uh, even though, uh, you know, again, I don't know if he was atheist. I mean, it seemed like he, he was a troubled soul, but, I mean, he did have some glimmerings of religion. But he did say, if the universe is by chance and we're all by chance, then art should also be by chance. So you can start to see these little worldviews, uh, Kooning, uh, the fragmentation of uh, mankind, uh, Marcel Duchamp, really with the uh, uh, with a nihilistic bend on uh, on art to where he completely said it is without meaning it is and we're fragmented. This is actually a lady coming down a staircase, uh, and then the fragmentation, uh, the cubism. Uh, Picasso really took that to the next level. Uh, artist poop. I mean, this was kind of uh, as much in your face as you can get because pretty much. Uh, he canned his own feces, and and that to basically just show everything is worthless. And one of these sold a few years ago, uh, almost brought five hundred thousand dollars. I mean, once one, um, uh, piss on Christ was this one from the '80s. So you can kind of parallel and see tick and tie where something connects. Now some Christians get offended by this; they really did in the '80s. To me, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, it's just an expression. And to me, Christians at that time should have said, wow, uh, we, they're very offended here about something associated with Christians. We need to step it up and do something different. Uh, of course, you've got uh, Francis Bacon, uh, so on and so forth. My point being, to begin with this, is why pay $15 million for a white canvas, which recently sold? White canvas, $15 million. And this was kind of led by uh, Barnett. Uh, Newman, his stripe, uh, Mark Rothko, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is no different than what we're going to be talking about with naturalism. I just think it's a little bit before we jump into a lot of the uh, details to kind of start with something where, because I do think art and aesthetics is very neglected. And uh, you can think of me kind of like Tom Wolfe, if any of you know him. Uh, Bonfire of the Vanities was his uh, probably most famous work. But he also wrote uh, The Painted Word which was, uh, I believe it was the 70s, where he basically said, this, this art, like white canvas, it, this is nonsense. And to my knowledge, I, I mean, if he, was, if he was a Christian, I didn't know it. He died a few years ago. Uh, ironically, he also wrote The Kingdom of Speech, which was an attack on Darwinism. So again, like I said, think of me as Tom Wolfe. I should have actually brought a white suit. That would have been, that would have been a good touch. Uh, mainly because he said literature, language, it could not have came about the way neo-Darwinists would say it did. And he even made it onto The Simpsons. Okay, so why bring this all up? Think postmodernism, because that's a very good parallel to naturalism as we're going to talk about it. This is a postmodern building. Looks very off the kilter, and uh, but it's ironic because uh, I lived in uh, New York City for a couple of years, and I had the chance to uh, Ask one of these uh, architects, uh, just kind of laughingly, I said, hey, is the foundation postmodern? And he laughed, 
and said, well, of course not. If it was, it would collapse. So again, I think that is good food for thought as far as uh, naturalism holistically. Postmodernism, believe anything. Uh, and again, this ties in beautifully uh, to uh, the 1966, I think, probably says up there, uh, Time Magazine, Is God Dead? And this is just kind of with art, with our educational system at the mid 20th century. Uh, like I said, I think this is a 1960 publication. It kind of came out boom. Again, parallel that to today, this magazine is Truth Dead. I believe it was last year it came out. So again, two plus two equals four, not to me, maybe for you. So this is nonsense, it's white noise. And that's kind of where we're gonna begin this uh, very quick talk uh, over all these viewpoints. So keep that in mind. And we're gonna basically be uh, following Douglas Axe. The way he wrote this book, Undeniable, I had the privilege of uh, the Discovery Institute flying me up there for uh, about a week and a half. And I got to go to this, uh, his book release party, ask him some questions. And, you know, as a, as a Harvard postdoc, and uh, I mean, he's a wealth of knowledge as far as uh, within chemical and molecular biology. And basically in this book, he says, look, you don't have to have a PhD to be able to look at something, whether it be art, whether it be a computer and figure out you know what, there's something to this. I mean, we, we it, he's basically saying for too long, we just, uh, and a lot of the students, uh, I don't know about you guys, but some of the other students I've talked to constantly, oh, I don't know, my professor said. Well, did you think it through? No, but the professor said it. Well, the professor could be wrong. So really quickly, Doug Axe here, he explains how the natural intuition of design is not only innate but intellectually scientifically valid confirmed by what Axe calls common science and uh, this is all beautifully explained explain. Axe is a beautiful writer in under 300 pages uh, my aim Axe writes is to liberate my readers uh, from their dependence on the experts and what I mean by that is almost every professor from 200 years ago guess what almost everything they said especially in science was wrong 100 years ago, wrong. 50 years ago, wrong. So there are certain things that we just have to think about when we're going through this. And again, I hear this all the time. There's no scientific evidence for the existence of God. That's nonsense. But people will still say that over and over and over. So the point of this talk really quickly, for Christian and non-Christian, I don't know where you guys fall in that spectrum, but it's, just think about it, because I know if you're a hardcore atheist, uh, uh, I saw Doug back there, uh, he, he's not going to change his mind. You could actually show him, you could spell it out in the clouds, Doug, believe in me, he won't. It, it's just not going to happen. Uh, but what I'm asking is just think this through. What is the best cumulative case for all of reality? We're just going to speed through these, and then again, like I said, I think the real uh, meat and potatoes is going to be uh, I'm here all afternoon. Let's talk. Let's uh, get a beer. Just kidding. Let's uh, uh, talk about these things. I mean, I don't have all the answers. No, I probably do. No, I'm kidding. But that's the part of it. So naturalism and non-naturalism, a rational discussion. I purposely use non-naturalism at the beginning just to say, uh, because naturalism is what's holding basically all this together. And it's, it, it's literally an emperor that has no clothes on. Um, it is a very weak theory, and a lot of atheists are abandoning it. They're still keeping atheism, but they're saying, you know what, I'm not a naturalist. Because all naturalists are atheists, but not all atheists are naturalists. And if you say naturalism and God, the atheist immediately will say, well, if that's my only two choices, and I see that a lot, especially with uh, professors, they cling on to naturalism. But cause, if they say, okay, God's the only other option, I'm just saying, let's at least say non-naturalism. That'll be a next uh, logical step. And Doug, actually, it's funny, I put him on the spot. He said he is not a naturalist, so he doesn't believe in naturalism, but he also doesn't believe in non-naturalism. So I'm like, well, you're an agnostic. And he got kind of frustrated. No, I'm an atheist. 
So real quickly, let's define a couple of terms. Theism, belief in the existence of God or gods, especially the belief in one God as creator of the universe, intervening in it and sustaining a personal relationship to his creatures. There are some branches, not going to go into it, like a sub-branch of theism is deism, which would basically take the personal out, kind of Aristotle's unmoved mover. He got, you know, God got everything started, but is not involved today. Either one of those would be a non-naturalistic theory. Uh, naturalism, in a nutshell, nature is everything. There is nothing beyond it. Nature is also termed as materialism. Sometimes you'll hear physicalism. These do have subtle differences. Uh, but in a nutshell, whoop. There we go. In a nutshell, naturalism is metaphysics, which considers nature as the whole of reality. It, it excludes what is supernatural or otherworldly. Everything can be reduced down to matter. You and I eventually keep running the clock back, and we will be inorganic materials or rocks. Morality, it's illusionary. It doesn't even exist. Right, wrong, doesn't exist. These are all just mental concepts. Uh, designing the universe. Okay, we'll get into that, but everything can be reduced back down to matter. So again, which is the most logical, coherent, and consistent view in, let's clarify that, 2019? I have people throw quotes at me from like the 60s or 70s, and I'm like, well, let's, let's pretend it's 2019 since it is. Because normally, what you'll usually see is something like this, religion versus science. Uh, they, in this one, they, I'm surprised they threw in Muslim, but they got Muslims and Christians leading science and progress to the, uh, the hangman's noose. And this is usually the kind of nonsense that you'll get from the, uh, you know, Google arguments, uh, you know, which, which are on the level of flat earth uh, or moon made of cheese. Uh, these internet atheists um, uh, are the ones that will just throw these little mantras out. Usually they don't know that much about what they're talking about. Nancy Piercy. The soul of science, she went back through Christian faith and natural philosophy. Almost all the great scientific ideas of the last 500 years uh, was used with a Christian, like let's say Newton, trying to understand God better. So the fact that it's religion versus science is, is just a red herring. And again, I believe naturalism holistically has been completely responsible for the dumbing down of America ever since the... Uh, uh, really the 50s, but the 70s especially, the supposed Flynn effect uh, with IQ levels going up completely has more than double the rate of going down, uh, which literally, like that movie, was it Idiocracy? That's where we're headed if we don't do something. And usually in this situation, uh, it, it's just there's no critical thinking. Like to challenge something like Darwinism or, or just to say, will you at least, at least teach some of these weaknesses? Nope. So there's just no critical thinking uh, or logic or rhetoric or anything. Very quickly, probably should have started with this, uh, but it usually snoo people snooze or tune me out. Real quick, I was gr I grew up in uh, the boonies uh, on a farm, uh, moved to New York City. So in other words, I've kind of been all over the place. I'm not really, I'm just as comfortable in the woods as I am a big city. Uh, in 2008, I had the privilege of helping uh, with a documentary. I've got some free ones in the back for anyone that wants them. Uh, expelled, no intelligence allowed. This will show a lot of what I'm kind of talking about here as far as academic freedom. It'll go over a lot of that. And that's from the Discovery Institute Center of Science and Culture. Uh, ironically, for three, three and a half years, I actually worked at a microbiology lab uh, on this campus. And I remember uh, a lady that I worked with, Jenna, uh, was an atheist, really nice person, but she challenged me. James, do you honestly think there's a God? And um, even though I wasn't brought up in a uh, church or anything, I said, yeah, I do. And then she hit me with all these questions. I didn't really have any answers. And uh, so again, oh, I show this. I forgot that was in there. Basically, it's showing the boxer. Uh, no wonder kickboxing was so hard. Uh, I may take that out. For some, I was I did boxing once upon a time, and then I said, you know what, I want to do kickboxing. And I was like, you know what, I want to do wrestling. I want to do grappling. I want to do judo. And I kind of combined a lot of those in. That's kind of 
what we're looking at today is a multi-pronged approach, whether it's history, whether it's science, whether it's uh, any of the sciences, uh, the, the social sciences, the natural sciences, they all point to the falsification of naturalism and the truth of theism, specifically Christian theism. Uh, again, like I said, Perfect Church, uh, we, once in a blue moon, I think I went on Christmas and Easter with my grandparents to church. I was brought up in a very good home, a loving home, but we, we didn't go to church or anything, so I'm not trying to, you know, twist your arm to go to, to a church or anything. Uh, the Existential Cafe uh, at the top, it's basically just, that seems to be a big component. That was in my life, and I've heard a lot of that from uh, students, is just, why do I exist? Why does anything exist? What's the point of life? That's why you see, unfortunately, people like uh, Anthony Bourdain had everything and he killed himself. Uh, and, and you just see that time and time again. And he really had an existential crisis, I think, because in a lot of his shows, uh, he's a great storyteller, but he would a lot of times say, like his friend, I think was Buddhist, and he would always say, yeah, I know there's no God, there's no point to anything. And then he would go on with the show, but he would always throw these little existential cries out there. And unfortunately, uh, he uh, killed himself. Uh, so I think I wish I could have had to have a conversation with him. Uh, again, my background, philosophy of religion and history, uh, ancient history specifically. Uh, undergraduate was philosophy of religion and the master's was ancient history. Out of that came the books that we're kind of, that we're going through today and that's free in the back. So I mean, it's not like I make any money, so I'm just giving them away. But uh, because I think, I wish someone would have done this to me 20 years ago. Uh, but anyway, naturalism and religion uh, was basically my revised master's uh, thesis. And uh, the Discovery Institute looked through it. They provided the foreword. Um, and then Logos Research Associates, uh, again, keep in mind, I just got back from a, a three-day conference. Literally yesterday I landed uh, and then tried to get prepared and come out here. But there's over, and it shows everybody there, over 50 PhD uh, people, a lot more expertise than myself. Uh, my specialty is this, I'm the only historian on the team. But any, anything that you guys really wanted to deep dive, let's say math, well, we've got some math PhDs, so let me know. I can reach out to them. So this isn't just James's uh, two cents. This is backed by Logos Research Associates, which is a, uh, uh, a plethora of good minds, great people. Uh, and if somebody specifically wanted a geologist, we've got a ton of those. Whatever the case is, uh, they're only a phone call away. So if I don't have the answer, we'll find somebody that does. And then mere Christian apologetics is basically my thesis just really simplified without all the text, uh, technical jargon. Uh, naturalism and religion, I think, is uh, 360 pages. Mere Christianity is about 150. So I really simplified it. Uh, and then Labrie, Francis Schaefer Studies, uh, is another group I'm associated with. And again, I've already kind of talked about this. Logos Research Associates, uh, you've gotten their information, like I said. John Sanford, geneticist, uh, has kind of headed this up, but I mean, we've got all kinds of qualified uh, and seasoned uh, professionals that, that are substantiating what I'm saying here. So this isn't just James, you know, he had some ideas. And uh, Paul Nelson, I mean, great group of people. Uh, and like I said, if you have specific questions and I don't know it, we'll get with some people to have. And if all of a sudden I'm making this up, let's just say geology. I could probably get us uh, a week-long uh, geology conference set up here uh, on creation and geology with 10 PhD geologists if we needed. So there, right. let me put them all in there. All right, so again, I've already talked about that, what's different about Logos versus others. Uh, our main goal is just simply to show and remind you that naturalism holistically is all but dead. Uh, there's a few people still calling themselves, like Sean Farrell will change it to poetic naturalism, which doesn't revert back to nature. It's mainly just because he knows naturalism is false, but he doesn't want to turn to non-naturalism, so he's calling it something it's not, so he can keep calling himself a naturalist. Uh, again, and also realize that Christian theism is more intellectually true probably than ever before. 
I mean, today. I mean, Gary Habermas uh, just recently made the comment to me that, uh, uh, and again, before I forget, I'm actually talking to him this evening, if anybody has any questions specifically around uh, the resurrection. But again, realize that Christianity is, we, we have more evidence than probably ever before. And uh, so it's not an intellectual problem. It's usually more of a heart problem, an existential problem. What about pluralism? We'll touch on that. But again, and if you are a Christian, you should be very confident and in through Christ in all that you do. Because we can agree to disagree on some of the finer points, uh, but I do like logos more than some groups uh, that I've worked with before. Uh, again, creation and evolution. These two books give you a multiplicity of sides and the so that it's not just one. I recommend both. Just if you're wanting to say, well, I want to hear the opposite side. Well, this has all of them in rebuttals. Uh, it's, a, it's a couple of good books. Now, I used to work with William Lane Craig. Many of you probably know him. Uh, again, great guy. Uh, my wife and I had the privilege of going to kind of retrace the footsteps of Paul. And uh, we went to, with him and some other scholars, to uh, Italy, Turkey, Greece, and uh, it was really good. But, first of all, he's one person. It's all William Lane Craig. At least, you know, with Logos, you've got James, but you've also got over 50 that's saying the same thing. So you've got a multiplicity of views. Uh, and same thing with Ken Ham. Uh, it's really, there's a few of them, but it's really more Ken Ham. Now don't get me wrong, both of these, I agree with probably 90% of what they say. William Lane Craig, unfortunately, is getting a little bit shaky on some of the things like, you know, well, maybe there isn't a historical fall. And I'm like, seriously? But, uh, and then Ken Ham sometimes can be a little bit too dogmatic on, uh, on his viewpoint. And again, that's why I still find the Francis Schaeffer approach. Uh, agree to disagree on some of the small points. The big ones is the focus, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, he did it probably better than anyone. And that's what we're basically going to be doing, uh, not only with Logos, but with this talk and the avenue of my book. Like I said, we're really going to be focusing more on uh, Mere Christian Apologetics. I did do a book, uh, my most recent one on the philosophy of art, very small. I'm definitely no expert in the arts, but, and these are all free in the back. And I specifically, uh, Mere Christian Apologetics is definitely more for the Christian, uh, I would say. Uh, and then the philosophy of history is probably, really could be for either, uh, but it, it's, it's much more technical and it really dives a lot deeper into these issues. I purposely had two somewhat differing sides do the forward to mere Christian apologetics. Uh, Ken Hoven, many of you heard of him. I know I don't, there's a decent amount of stuff that he does that I don't agree with. Uh, but still, I thought, you know what, he offered. Uh, and um, so I said, sure. So you've got him and you've got Casey Luskin of the Discovery Institute, Intelligent Design. A lot of times people put these at odds. We have more in common than, uh, than we have our differences, and we both can agree 100% that naturalism is false. Introduction, origin, history, human history. I'll speed it up a little bit. You've got that little handout with like the uh, 20 logical fallacies to avoid, uh, you know, things like straw man, non sequitur, uh, genetic fallacy. These little things, like during the Q&A, you know, when you're thinking of your question, you might read through those and say, am I, am I about to commit the genetic fallacy? And again, just some quotes here. Unlike scientism, which puts science, you know, up here, like above everything else, science in the true sense of the word is open to unbiased inve investigation of any phenomena. And I think that is a very good point because we've already seen scientism's on its uh, way out as well because uh, I mean, realistically, half of science always overturns. And when you look at something like history, uh, the social sciences, the literature, you'll have some tweaks and some adjustments, but holistically it stays pretty strong. Again, logical positivism, metaphysics is meaningless. This theory has been uh, debunked for almost a century, but I still have people asserting that it's accurate, even though no one, to my understanding, in any academia actually follows it anymore. And I'm of the opinion, strong opinion, I think it's more an opinion, that naturalism is in the exact same boat. 
So why hold an incredibly weak theory up that is completely stunning our knowledge, uh, stunning the ability to take the evidence where it leads if it doesn't really lead there? Uh, like the famous uh, philosopher Alvin Plantinga said, as far as I can see, there are no strong arguments at all for naturalism, but there are strong arguments against it. I therefore suggest that naturalism, like logical positivism that we just looked at, should be consigned to the scrap heap of philosophical history. Uh, capturing Christianity, uh, a uh, blog site. By the way, science is in conflict with naturalism, not with religion. And I couldn't agree more. And just to kind of, so you'll see what I'm saying, Francis Schaeffer had this really good, uh, what he would call the line of despair. And the concept of truth has been dis, uh, divided, and it still is today. You've basically got what he would call upper story, lower story, to where you have theology, morality, uh, you know, God talk. Well, that's all just subjective, and it's relativistic, so yeah, it's fine. Keep it, but keep it over here in the corner. Uh, but science, that is, uh, like naturalism, is public, it's objective for everyone, and that's why Anytime I try to host a speaker, a lot of times, the universities try to shut it down. And I'm like, and I've encouraged them, these professors, I'm like, okay, blow my guests out of the water. Come here today. Like, like that's what the little ad said. Destroy me in front of you guys. I mean, it wouldn't be, it shouldn't be that hard if I'm really that false. So basically, that line should be torn away because the only way that line should ever be there is if naturalism is true, which it's not. So again, upper story, it's an irrational leap of faith. Uh, uh, basically, like we're saying, pretty much you have the uh, religion, subjective, science, naturalism, objective. And this really has stunted, uh, I think, academic growth for probably the last 50 years, if not century. So again, there should only be a wall if, or a dividing line if naturalism is true. And as we'll see, naturalism is almost certainly false. Therefore, we should not be imprisoned to only naturalistic hypotheses. Francis Schaeffer, there is no permeation of interchange. There is a complete dichotomy between the upper and lower stories that we talked about. The line between the upper and lower stories has become concrete, horizontal, 10,000 feet thick, with highly charged barbed wire fixed in the concrete. Below the lines, there is rationality and logic. The upper story becomes the non-logical and the non-rational. There is no relationship between them. In other words, in the lower story, on the basis of all reason, man as man is dead. And uh, the Expelled documentary ties into a lot of this. Uh, it just shows how academic freedom, and mostly in the United States, uh, Europe to a lesser degree, but, uh, but Europe's also a few steps back as well. Um, and again, if a person does view our world through the through biblical glasses, is it what you would think you would see? Again, I'm just saying, uh, I'm just saying, as we're going to go through this, you could think of anything. Well, creation, does it make more sense, naturalism or the Bible? What does the Bible say about it? Again, just keeping it in there. So again, naturalism implies the Bible is not real history. And how we view events, for example, think about that line, uh, the American Civil War, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, fall of the Roman Empire, World War II, there's the dividing line. Those are historical events. Jonah and the whale, parting of the Red Sea, Noah's Ark and the Flood, uh, Noah's Ark and the Flood, Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. That's all on that lower story uh, of the make-believe. But again, it's not, as we'll see, and as I've written about. Uh, same thing with creation. Now, the Christians, on the other hand, because I know I'm kind of divided here, because I know there's some Christians, and I also know there's some skeptics that I talked to right beforehand. But at the same time, Christians do need to step it up, because a lot of times they get kind of petrified with fear, like I was uh, working at the microbiology lab when the, the girl approached me 20 years ago, I guess. And again, you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Calm down. That's, uh, again, there's incredibly good reasons, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist, uh, case in point, to get these down uh, really well. And again, the reason that this is important, whether you're a Christian uh, or to think about it if you're not, 
is Genesis. I'm using that as an example here. And again, I'm open. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, say, for example, Ken Ham, where I'm just so dogmatic on some of these points. No, I'm open. And there's a lot of these points I'm, I don't know. And I'm very uh, open to the evidence. But Genesis, I mean, it does give a correlation, whether it be uh, sin, whether there, is there a fall, it does explain that death, marriage, clothing. I mean, why, why are we, none of us came in naked, I noticed, yet. Uh, work, uh, Jesus. But Genesis does form that uh, bedrock for the gospel and for kind of everything we do. So to the Christians out there, sometimes when I hear them say, oh, who cares about all that creation in Genesis? Just, just believe Jesus. He loves you. Well, that's true. But eventually you or a skeptic or somebody, you've got to have that foundation and Genesis not only provides that foundation, it provides a ontological foundation uh, really for all of reality. And I think that's what makes it uh, so incredible. Uh, it is, again, if Genesis is not literal history with a literal very good creation and a literal Adam and Eve, then sin did not literally enter the world and their actions. And therefore, you and I don't literally need to be saved or a savior. And that's where it gets important. And... Uh, uh, Richard Bozart in The American Atheist, uh, he summed this up pretty good, I thought. Uh, real quick, Christianity has fought and still fights and will continue to fight science uh, to the desperate end over evolution because evolution, uh, I would probably rephrase that a little bit more with naturalism, but evolution, uh, as, as we see too, it really is uh, part and parcel because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve in the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. And honestly, he's right. I mean, I hate to say it, but he's more right than a lot of the, the Christians in, in the churches that you know I talk to. And, and sometimes it's like, oh, he's, he's wanting to talk about creation. No, no, let's just focus on Jesus loves you. And uh, he gets it. And sometimes they don't. Again, remember the word transparency. So again, as we're just kind of wrapping up the introduction here, how would you respond? If God created the universe, who created God? This is actually a very easy question. I'm dumbfounded when I hear people still ask it, especially that Richard Dawkins made that the, the, the kind of heart of his book, The God Delusion. Uh, and it's a simple uh, answer, but... You think about it. Isn't evolution science and creation just a religion? I'm not going to say anything. What do you think? Why do so many scientists believe in evolution? It can't be wrong, could it? Well, the same scientists are probably going to also disagree that uh, the Bible's right. How could they be wrong on it? Again, just, uh, just thinking, throwing that out there. Can you really trust the Genesis creation account? Have scientists disproved the Bible? Creation from nothing? A flood? A book way out of date? What about pluralism? Can't we all get along? That's very bigoted if you say your way is the only way. Again, all of these are good questions that we should have answers for. And again, the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects. And that's why Genesis does provide a solid foundation. And I should make the comment, uh, you know, my degrees were all at secular universities. So uh, so I kind of went into the lion's den here. It wasn't like I went to you know a Christian school and just kind of rehearsed what they wanted me to say. I mean, so I wasn't just spoon feeding myself. And again, like I said again, Christians, don't panic. These all have very, very easy answers. And again, 90% uh, of the 9 out of 10 questions you get are always the same. So you'll have easily, and again, most of them uh, in the back of my book, uh, which again is free, take one for a friend, a skeptic, whoever, uh, it should easily get you equipped to answer at least the 90%. And again, you have my contact information, and I have the contact information of the 50 plus scientists. So again, Christianity under attack, no surprise there. Secular professors in the universities ought to arrange things so that students who enter as bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. That well, sounds like indoctrination. Again, watch Expelled. And it's also free on YouTube. 
Uh, students are fortunate to find themselves under the benevolence of people like me, him, atheist professor, and to have escaped the grip of their frightening, vicious, and dangerous parents. We are going to go right on trying to discredit you, the parents, in the eyes of your children, trying to strip your fundamental religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. And I so wish Dr. Rorty was here. I would love to have a conversation with him because I, again, he sounds very like, ah, the angry atheist. It's usually all bark, no bite, I can assure you. And I've talked to a lot of atheist groups, uh, and it's usually, they don't even know what they believe once you start asking them some questions. Again, keep thinking this. What best accounts for reality uh, holistically? Don't take my word for it. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm wanting you to really uh, go through these. And again, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'll stay until I pass out. Philosophy is our friend. Very quickly, just this will kind of help you at a very high level just to kind of understand where I'm going. Uh, real quick, John is taller than Jane, right? Okay, I get that. Jane is taller than Joe. Okay. If those two are accurate, then John is taller than Joe. You're like, well, yeah. This is a deductive argument. So in other words, if premise one and two are right, number three logically and necessarily follows. So keep this in mind when I'm going through some of these. Uh, and again, there's two types of arguments. Deductive, like we just saw, the, the conclusion logically and necessarily follows. I'll also be using some inductive. What that basically means is it's probably true. Uh, I can't get it worked into a deductive argument, but, uh, with the premises, but the premises logically follow, so it's probably true. Maybe uh, 90 to 99 percent probably true, but not quite to the 100 percent because of the way the argument goes. And again, my big thing here is critical thinking skills, uh, reasoning, evaluating, analyzing, problem solving. Think these things through, whether you're a secularist or uh, another religion or uh, atheist or a Christian. And again, we won't be using too much of uh, abductive, but again, these will just kind of familiarize yourself with the terms because we will be making some of these. So again, following uh, Doug Axe's motto in Undeniable, we're going to keep things pretty simple, but also encourage you because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to get this down. Uh, Christianity is absolutely greater than naturalism. Uh, and it's more plausible, and it's mo more coherent, and it's more consistent. Genesis does provide a holistically good ontology. I'm sorry, these are questions that we're going to be thinking about. ID, creationism, evolutionism, well, what, what's the difference? The Bible is the best historic book we have. You've got to be kidding. We have more evidence than we need to know that Christianity is true, what Gary Habermas said. And what are you doing if you're a Christian? 1 Peter 3.15 uh, says, always have an answer for those who ask for the faith inside of you but do so with humbleness and respect. And again, the Mere Christian Apologetics book in the back should cover 90% of the questions you're going to get asked. And it has a lot of uh, questions and answers, and it also has uh, uh, further reading to get more honed in on the book at, a, at a, those topics at a high level. So again, keep asking yourself through this whole thing, what is the best inference, the inference to the best explanation? And again, justifying historical descriptions, uh, basically that's just saying which one is less ad hoc, it's more plausible, less contrived, um, it's got good explanatory scope, good explanatory power. These, and I go through them in the book, but it, it brings together to where you say, you know what, as far as a cumulative case, uh, let's say uh, beginning of the universe, man, I got to give that one to the Bible. It makes a lot more sense than just a universe out of nothing. Okay, well, there's one here. I'm making this up. And then maybe the next one you say, no, no, I don't like that one. I'm going to put this one over here on the secular naturalist side. Okay, go for it. And just see how these add up. Open philosophy, basically it means it's not closed. So take the evidence where it leads. 1 Peter 3.15, what we talked about earlier. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give 
to everyone who asks you a reason for that hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And again, a lot of Christians don't know the simple questions. And again, don't beat yourself up about it. It's fine. Uh, I didn't either at one point. It literally wasn't that long ago. It doesn't seem maybe 15 years ago, 16, that, I mean, you could have named a few books in the Bible, and I probably was like, I don't know, is that Old Testament? But again, there's no reason not to be on the offense, not angry offense, but on the offense, because literally, I don't know of any uh, area that is on the side of naturalism, to be brutally honest. And again, keep in mind, God doesn't need defending, but people do need help understanding. That's the uh, Ravi Zacharias motto, and that's kind of what we're doing here. We're not trying to argue you into a, a relationship with Jesus. It's mainly just saying that people do need help understanding, and that's what apologetics really is. So introductions want, are done. You survived. So now, keep in mind, logosassociates.org, because now we're going to pick it up pretty fast will have a lot of stuff broken out to go into these a lot deeper. And, uh, and again, I'm a phone call or an email away. Part two, origins. And this is what I really dive into uh, in the philosophy of history book, uh, Naturalism versus Biblical Theism. So again, a few questions. Why does anything at all exist instead of just nothing? Contingency. Uh, origin of space, time, and matter. I mean, if you really think about this, these are big questions. Uh, is the fine-tuning that you sometimes hear people talk, is it exaggerated? What about morality and ethics? Uh, life's origin. Could we really, if we just had inorganic material, like rocks, and we just said, step back, in around two to three billion years, that's going to be up here giving a lecture. That's what the naturalists say happened. A true naturalist. And neo-Darwinism, the all-encompassing uh, fact of Darwin hypotheses. So the inference that the naturalist will usually make, eh, spontaneous universe, it just happened. Eh, spontaneous fine-tuning. Spontaneous life, it just happened to come together. Spontaneous ascent, yes, it came from rocks to you and me. Yeah, spontaneous mankind, there's no point in history. Again, I don't find these that compelling, and we, we know that all of these are false. But what's interesting, and I was looking through some, uh, I always do that, I went to uh, your campus bookstore and went through, and they still have some of this old, outdated material still in them. It always amazes me. It, a few of them have gotten better. Like if I look at a college book like 10 years ago, it had like a ton in it. But even today, they still have, I mean, I, 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 they, they know better, so I do think it is lies. So lies in the textbook. And again, as far as inference goes, just think about what some of these non-Christian uh, minds have said. Uh, Alexander Blinken. All the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. Not some, not most, all. The universe had a beginning? Well, what caused it? Paul Davies, again, an agnostic. There's, for me, powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. He's not a design advocate, and he's not a, a Christian, but he's just saying what how it is. Well, what about the multiverse, right? We'll get into that, but... Guess what? There's not a single shred of evidence for the multiverse. Even Lawrence Krauss, Sean Carroll, these guys admit it. I just had somebody uh, last week go on and on about it, and finally I said, you're a big fan of Lawrence Krauss, right? Oh, yeah. Well, he says there's no evidence. He does. Yeah. And then I showed him. He said, oh, uh, if in order to explain this universe, you need a theory that invents an infinite number of parallel universes, that's not a very good theory. And I tend to agree. I mean, again, Ben Stein, in the Expelled documentary, asked Richard Dawkins, well, how did life get started? Dawkins? Well, it was a slow process. Well, what was it? Dawkins? Well, nobody knows. Okay, that's, you're like the leader of the atheist group. You don't have a good answer. Uh, David Berlinski, an agnostic Jew, 
Uh, well, what do you what does he think about let's say neo Darwinism, Darwin Darwinism evolution? Uh, I'm kind of encapsulating them because they get tricky, but neo Darwinism is everything basically wrapped into one. There are gaps in the fossil graveyard, places where there should be intermediate forms, where a fossil is transitioning, changing into something else, but there where there is nothing, there is nothing whatsoever instead. No paleontologist denies that this is so. It's simply a fact. Darwin's theory and the fossil record are in conflict. What? I didn't hear that in class. Michael Denton, again, not a Christian. Uh, is it really credible that a random process could have constructed a reality which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man? Is it really credible? And uh, uh, Kenyon, let us dispose of a common misconception, the complete transmutation of even one animal species into a different species has never been observed, either in the laboratory or in the field. Dogs stay dogs. So again, keep those quotes kind of in mind. Defining science is critical. Operational and historical, I go through this in the book, especially the uh, philosophy of history, where basically you have uh, operational. It's accessible by the scientific method. You test it just like I did in my three and a half years at your microbiology laboratory. And you can test these things to see what's the outcome. Historical. These aren't testable. That's why in the book I make a good outline for it's really more of an origin history than origin science. I mean, the Big Bang. Well, I'm going to reproduce it. Well, you can't. Life from non-life. They've tried. They can't. So all of these are historical sciences. So all they're doing is putting a naturalistic uh, spin on it to make an inference. And that's what's in your textbooks that I was looking through. But there's no proof for any of it. They're just assuming naturalism is true. And like I've said, and more, and it's becoming harder and harder to deny it, naturalism is almost certainly false. So the facts speak for themselves, right? Not really. Not when it comes to origin. That's why the professors are kind of like, let me explain it to you, but don't ask too many questions. And again, I hope we can all agree at least to keep critical thinking. So what is the naturalism, what would naturalism, like atheism, let's say, or either one, what would they do to explain all these things? Meaning, uh, there is none. And Alex Rosenberg, this is pretty much uh, his exact response when he was asked these questions. Contingency? Well, we're just here. Big Bang? That just happened. What about biogenesis? Life from non-life? Well, that just happened. Neo-Darwinism? Well, from primordial soup and inorganic materials to us, of course. Civilization? Ah, it just happened. Religion in the Bible? Just myths. Okay, well, what would non-naturalism say, such as theism? Reality? is objective. We have an ontological base because there's meaning. We're made in God's image. Contingency. God is the objective reality. Same with uh, the beginning of the universe. Biogenesis. Uh, Neo-Darwinism doesn't really have a chance. It's not that it is. There is definitely problems with Darwinism, as we'll talk about, uh, from a biblical standpoint. But even if I wasn't a Christian, I still wouldn't be a Darwinist because there, there's just there's no evidence. And it amazes me when I'll talk to like a, a biology uh, instructor, usually at a junior college, because the professors, uh, PhDs usually will, uh, uh, don't want to talk about it, but they'll, we start talking and they haven't really thought these things through. And I just ask a few questions and they're like, you know what? That's a good point. Uh, civilization, creation, flood, Babel. Well, there's actually pretty good proof, uh, from history that these are real and religion in the Bible. Why the Bible? We're going to talk about that. Again, the word evolution has many meanings. Real quickly, cosmic evolution would be basically following some type of Big Bang, which has a lot of problems with it, but I'm using that as just a broad statement for the beginning of the universe. Uh, in other words, it just came together, all the chemicals, uh, from cosmic to chemical, stellar, planets just somehow arrived just how they were supposed to, organic life from non-life, and then macro would be, you know, a dog eventually becoming something else, like a dog becoming a cat or something like that. Microevolution or variations is different types of dogs. No one denies that. There's 
a chihuahua, there's a Great Dane, there's all kinds of different ones. But when somebody says, do you believe in evolution? It's always, that's why I use, usually use the word neo-Darwinism because uh, it's a little less slippery, but make sure that you ask them what they mean. And again, uh, academicfreedomday.com, teach the controversy. This is a big initiative by the Discovery Institute. Uh, and again, a lot of them aren't Christian, but you know, so I mean, but I mean, they're again, like Darwin said, a fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides. So why not at least look at the weaknesses of Darwinism and naturalism? And so keep in mind, what is that best inference to the best explanation? Support your conclusions with good evidence. Big Bang, unbounded extrapolation. Remember our arguments? Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. If those two are true, the universe has a cause. Now, the Big Bang is in itself beyond space, time, and matter because it's the point where space, time, and matter came into being. So whatever that cause is would have to be beyond space, beyond time, beyond matter. Well, if you stop right there, that kind of sounds like God. But again, I would be more than entertained to say, well, James, we think it's something else. Okay, what? Going from more of a contingency one on the next level, if the universe has a cause, that cause is best defined as God, what we just talked about. The universe does have a cause. That cause is God. That would be a better example of an inductive argument. The top one is deductive. Now, again, this is where it gets a little confusing. The Big Bang, that's kind of what people are picturing. But keep in mind, people are picturing empty space and an explosion. No, there was no space. This would be looking outside of it, so you couldn't. There was no space. There was no time. There was no matter. Nothingness. And then there was something. I kind of think, what does the Bible say? In the beginning, God spoke and brought the universe into, huh? no, it just happened. But anyway, the origins of the universe, how did it begin? Now, what's interesting here is here's a good example of almost like a decision tree. Uh, let's just look at these, okay. Is there a beginning? Again, can't go into a lot of detail here, but pretty much, whoops, everybody agrees like we saw that one quote uh, where all models have a beginning. So yeah, there's a beginning, so scratch the last one off. Now right there, if we stop, the only thing that the naturalist can hold on to is the being from non-being, order from chaos, or maybe just creation from nothing. Both of those are very problematic. So again, I think that alone points to God. But don't take my word for it, in case I'm putting words in their mouths. Popular, popular Science Magazine. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then, with a big bang, an almost infinitely small, hot, and dense universe exploded into existence. Question, if there was nothing, what exploded? Now, that's a little bit of a misnomer. When they say big bang, they don't really mean it as an explosion. That's just the, the name that stuck, that pretty much use, uh, that they use on these models. But again, it's, you're getting something from nothing. Again. Discover Magazine, the universe burst into something out of absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. And this is a, this is a peer-reviewed uh, extrapolation. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing when you read this uh, from their own uh, lips. New Scientist Magazine, what's the big deal? Biggest deal of all is how you get something out of nothing. Don't let the cosmologists try to kid you on this one. They have not got a clue either. In the beginning, they will say there was nothing. No time, space, matter, or energy. Then there was a quantum fluctuation, which, whoop, stop right there. You see what I mean? First there is nothing, and then is something. And the cosmologists try to bridge the two with a quantum flutter, uh, a.k.a. Lawrence uh, Krauss, a tremor of uncertainty that sparks it all off. Then they are aware, away, and before you know it, they have pulled 100 billion galaxies out of their quantum. You cannot fudge this by appealing to quantum mechanics. 
Either there is nothing to begin with, in which case no quantum vacuum, no pre-geometric uh, dust, no time, which anything can happen, no physical laws that can affect a change from nothingness into something, or there is something, in which case that needs explaining. And again, that was New Scientist magazine. So again, this is kind of, there's a lot of different views, but this would be where you have basically just out of nowhere. Now again, there would be nothingness at that light point. Again, some people will argue back and forth on the singularity piece. We're not going to go into that here. But basically you have that inflation and then they extrapolate uh, everything else. Uh, here would be another one where the universe is expanding out. But either way, no matter what, this gets back to a finite point. And they've tried all the, uh, to come up with other, other theories because they see that they're getting put in a corner. So they're like, maybe the universe could be eternal if we and all of these models have uh, failed. Steady state theory failed. Cyclical universe. Again, they're, they're trying to you know, look at bubble universes, these inflationary models. All of them are just what if scenarios. And again, we can't go into them, but I'll be more than happy to talk with you afterwards. But Robert Jastrow, he was the head of a uh, uh, same chair as uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble, sat in as an astronomer, not Christian. He said, what is, what is the ultimate solution to the origins of the universe? The answer provided by the astronomers are disconcerting and remarkable. Most remarkable of all is the fact that in science, as in the Bible, the world begins with an act of creation. And that's coming from a non-Christian. So if you take that, therefore, the universe has a cause. The cause would have to be a transcendent, timeless, non-spatial, immaterial, supremely powerful, intelligent, personal cause. Well, who made God? God is a self-existent, is self-existent, and the only adequate explanation for the universe. Because you notice premise one was, whatever began to exist, God did not begin to exist. He is the necessary reality, the ontological base. Real quick, fine-tuning, naturalism basically says it's either luck or necessity. Most don't say necessity anymore. That's why they try to invent the, the multiverse to give them more likely of a shot. All the uh, fine-tuning really boils down to is we're kind of in a Goldilocks area. And again, I'll go into more detail in the Q&A or afterwards when we're talking, if somebody wants to know. But, but basically, the, the chances of everything being just perfect are effectively zero. Uh, Non-naturalism is going to say there's an intelligent designer of some kind. There is design. Uh, so it's either luck, given enough time, planet, universe will become life permitting. Multiverse could solve this. Again, that's just a bunch of assertions. Non-naturalism would say it seems designed probably because it is designed and it's less ad hoc. So really quickly, I'm just going to use a couple of examples. There's hundreds of these examples, at least 30 in cosmology alone, about this fine uh, tuning. So if this ruler basically stretched across the universe, uh, our universe, and uh, or our galaxy, sorry, our entire galaxy, and let's say right here was gravity, and all you did was just moved it one inch, animals anywhere near the size of people would instantly be crushed if it was moved on the heavier side. Uh, insects would need very thick legs just to support themselves. Animals much larger would not survive. So again, for it to, it could have landed anywhere and it landed just perfect. And that's one constant. Because I mean, even think about the cells in your body, they have to hold together. Gravity is too light, they don't hold together, we die. It's too heavy, they crush, we die. Everything is on a razor's edge. And just really quickly, some people object to this. Most people, because uh, they say it's hard to put an exact number, but put any number you want. It's effectively zero. But just very quickly, if you said day-to-day -day facts of life, 10 to the eighth power to one ratio would be a fact. So what that means is there's a 10, seven zeros, and a one percent chance. You know, So if I said it was going to, if I said that there was a 0.0000000001% chance of rain today, it's probably not going to rain. Again, scientific evaluation, love Star Trek, 
10 to the 15th. Scientific law and uh, someone, uh, a lot of times when I do this, 10 to the 50th is usually pretty universally recognized, but somebody will say, well, I think it's 10 to the 70th. Well, that's fine. I'll give you 10 to the thousandth. It doesn't, or 10 to a millionth. It doesn't matter because like Bill Dembski, I think goes up to like uh, 10 to the 110th or something, or, or 10 to the 80th, somewhere in long air. But either way, if you're dropping this, uh, a rock, now it would take millions of years because these numbers are that big and never did it float off in the air. You could say it's a pretty good scientific law that gravity is real. So just keep those in mind. And, and as big as these numbers are, just to get your mind around it, 10 to the 18th seconds would be 15 billion years. Add one more, 10 to the 19th seconds. That's 150 billion years. Just one more, 10 to the 20th, 1.5 trillion years. So these numbers are huge. And keep in mind, 10 to the 50th is considered impossible. And if you want to say 10 to the 100th, knock yourself out. One chance in 100 million, billion, 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 billion. Not, that's, that's greater than 10 to the 50th, and that's just one. Combine the two, gravity and the cosmological constant. One chance in 100 million, trillion, 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 trillion. I couldn't write that number out on the slides. So, so in other words, it's zero. And that's why they invent these wild ideas of, of a multiverse, a what if scenario. Owen Greenwich, a common sense and satisfying interpretation of our world suggests the designing hand of a super intelligence. And put this in easily accessible terms, and this would be a ton more likely to happen uh, than the numbers we were talking about, the hundred trillion, trillion, trillion. This would actually be hugely more likely to happen. But again, using Douglas Axe's motto of common science, you have movers move your house. They literally just throw it into your house. Don't look. You come home, and it's perfect. More than likely, you're probably going to say, no, nah, no, nah, they didn't throw that in there. Common science, common sense, and it, it's multiplied 100 trillion, trillion, trillion times over when we're talking about the fine-tuning and life-permittingness of our place on Earth in the universe. Again, there's a lot of fine-tuning uh, uh, major proponents. Uh, personally, my favorite, uh, probably the best one, is Robin Collins. Again, I've got much more on the website on this. I did have the opportunity a couple years ago to visit uh, with Jay Richards and Gamero Gonzalez in Seattle. Uh, hopefully, they can do a sequel to The Privileged Planet. Great documentary, great book. Uh, again, Gonzalez was one that, just because he's uh, believes in design, uh, he got fired, so he pretty much said that he's kind of got to stay on the DL, and he can't do the sequel to the book until, like a follow-up, until he gets a tenure, so they can't fire him. Again, more on his story, too, in uh, the Expelled documentary. So fine-tuning. Remember our philosophical arguments. The apparent fine-tuning of the universe is due to either chance, necessity, or design. If you can find anything else, throw it in there. But these are the three usually. It is not due to chance or necessity. Therefore, it is due to design. And again, what's the naturalist going to say? Multiverse. I'm like, well, what if there's a, and even if you did say, okay, you know what, I'll give you that. For some reason, there's, a, there's this uh, infinitely amount of universes. Why are we in the right one? Well, it's just luck. Well, there we go again, luck. But again, there, there is no evidence. It is literally what if there was a, uh, an infinite amount of universes. What's producing them? We don't know. Just what if. Okay. And again, I'll sometimes hear we shouldn't be surprised to observe a universe which we can live in. Again, that's silly. Again, that you've probably heard the argument where it's like the guy that has got a thousand trains, trained marksmen. Uh, with perfect weapons, the guy's blindfolded, he's going to get assassinated or get uh, executed, and uh, all hundred of them shoot. He looks up. They missed. Well, it was just luck. No reason to ask why. It just happened. Of course not. 
it's going to be, no, something, something's up. Uh, God of the gaps, you always hear that. It's naturalism of the gaps. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, they have no good answers uh, for naturalism. And again, you get other odd answers. But again, design is the only one that really makes sense. Colombo. I'm not going to go too much into that. I'd love to, though, in the Q&A. If you guys even know, you may be too young, but he would usually ask questions, and I find that the best. Like, if I'm talking to a naturalist, instead of saying, this is what I think, I will usually just say, um, so you, do you think the universe is eternal? Oh, you don't? Oh, that's interesting. Do you think that it just brought itself into being? Let them answer. Usually, they're finally going to say, fine, I don't know. But, uh, again, that makes sense. And again, I'm covering these very quickly, go into a lot more detail in a, uh, other presentations or my website, or grab me and we'll talk just about that if you want. Origin of life. So now think about this. Nothing, now we have a universe. A Big Bang, whatever you want to call it, creation. Okay, how, now it all gets ordered just perfect. And now, somehow, we have the perfect fishbowl, Earth, atmosphere, everything is just perfect. Water, that's a must, but still no life. So now, what's the chance of life arising by accident? The belief that life on Earth arose by accident from non-living matter is simply a matter of faith. And that's coming from an evolutionist. Harold Morowitz, also a microbiologist, calculated the odds of a cell randomly assembling in the most ideal conditions to be one chance in 10 to the 100, what was that, billion? Again, that's just getting a cell. That's not getting life. You're just starting to get the pieces together from these inorganic materials. And keep in mind, 10 to the 50th-ish, impossible. But again, textbooks. Humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than 4 billion years ago. And you got to love their little maps where it's like, there's the bacteria, and then it goes into Darwin's tree. Oh, there we are. Oh, so there's six things between us? So literally, we came from rocks. Origin of life. Swirling in the waters of the oceans, the bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. It's so slow, it doesn't ever happen. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So again, it's completely conjecture. This isn't operational science. If it was, why can't we hand somebody chemical, or just, and that's in non-perfect, I mean, they, sorry, in perfect laboratory conditions where they can monitor everything, they can't get life from non-life. But they're saying it somehow happened by chance and again, they're asserting it absolutely is true. Uh, and again, this, I almost like jumped out of my chair. This was, a, my wife is uh, six years younger than me. And this was a, obviously a few years ago, but it was, it was like 2005-ish. Anyway, can't remember the date of this book. But this was her uh, university biology textbook. Life comes only from life, they start off by saying. Right, that's the law of biogenesis. Then what? Well, since it was the very first living thing, it had to come from non-living chemicals. So again, let's, let's have them give that to us uh, in a philosophical argument. Given enough time, life will come from non-life. Given enough time, sentiency will arrive from non-sentiency and consciousness. Again, this is silly just to say, well, since it was early, it had to come from non-living chemicals, like rocks. And again, the fact that that's in a university textbook, I mean, even the logic that they used was horrible. Just saying, well, it's early, so I guess it just came from non-living chemicals. And then they immediately just skip it and go straight on to, uh, and again, that's why naturalism, I, I'm just dumbfounded that it's still around uh, just because I think they're like, wait a minute, the only other way is God? Uh-uh, we can't let a divine foot in the door. Non-naturalism, like the Bible, well, guess what? We, we kind of like the laws of science. Life comes from only life, biogenesis. We're good with that. So again, on your little board or your notepad, life from non-life, hopefully, 
Now I got to give that one at least to the creationist, not the naturalist. So again, first law of thermodynamics, remember we can go into this, second law, cause and effect, biogenesis, all of these align with a creation account, a biblical creation account. None of them do with naturalism or evolution. Now what? We still got to get uh, all the animals. Usually you're going to hear these words from the naturalists like a bang, an explosion, a revolution. Then you know they're just trying to fill in some uh, cannon fodder and hopefully no one asks too many questions. This would basically be where we see an abrupt explosion of animal forms in the, again, not going into a lot of detail, but in the, uh, the Cambrian layers. And before that, there's like nothing. Well, so it just seemed like it was there. That's interesting. Doesn't the Bible say something about like God brought forth the animals? Kind of like that. Again, um, look for yourself as far as, uh, I mean, don't just take my assertion. Uh, Stephen Meyer, a friend of mine uh, from the Discovery Institute, uh, wrote a bestseller, Darwin's Doubt. Uh, it's a, I meant to bring it, but it's a beast. It's like six, 700 pages, maybe 500, something like that. But his, ex his entire uh, focus is just on the explosive origin of animal life and the case for intelligent design. Uh, and again, keep in mind Doug Axe, common science. This is a common sense approach. And it aligns very well with creation in the Bible. Again, phylogenetic tree of life. You'll still see this uh, inorganic material, and then it all comes into everything. And uh, I noticed that your campus store had one of those posters uh, that looked kind of like this one. I bought this when I was somewhere and I saw it, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And again, you can see right down there at the beginning, everything just swirls. This is 100% assertion. There's not one bit of evidence for it, not one. A uh, friend of mine, Jonathan Wells, uh, uh, double, doc, double doctorate, uh, wrote the polit Politically Incorrect Guide to Darwinism and Intelligent Design. It's a very easy read, uh, highly recommend it. Uh, David Belinsky, another example, real quick, as far as just looking at uh, Darwinism. In The Devil's Delusion, keep in mind, he's, he's an agnostic. Darwin's theory of evolution is the last of the great 19th century mystery religions. Amen. And as we speak, it is now following Freudian, Freudians and Marxism into the nether regions. And I'm quite sure that Freud, Marx, and Darwin are all commiserating, one with the other, in the dark dungeon where discarded gods gather. He's a brilliant guy, a uh, molecular biologist and mathematician, but uh, he's got a very good wit about him. So again, evolution, we've already defined these. Now we're gonna look more at the macroevolution type. So we pretty much see, okay, cosmic, chemical, stellar, organic. This is all conjecture. I think it's safe to say it's false. All you can say is, James, give it a few billion years. Well, as a historian, I can tell you, an ancient historian, uh, even though I'm not that old, I can tell you that anything about older than Hammurabi, about 1750 BC, it's very, very problematic for us to assess. So this billions of years life will come from non-life uh, hand waving it is completely not just a non sequitur. It's it's a uh, it's incoherent and it's uh, it's just false. So again, keep in mind macro micro. You'll have some professors, I'm sure, right here say, "Well, if you believe in micro." Macro comes from it. Absolutely false. Because what they're saying is finch beaks change size. There's different types of dogs. Yes, I agree with that. That doesn't mean the dog will eventually become a cat. And that is what their model asserts. So when someone says microevolution, and again, they'll allude billions of years, uh, sometimes hundreds of millions only, uh, it'll eventually become a non-dog. Again, where's some proof? There is zero. Whale evolution. Not going to get into a lot of detail here. There's a great article uh, 
that some of the colleagues at Logos Research Associates did. Um, and again, it's, it's on my site. Uh, this is one that they say, oh, we've got, we've got a good case here. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the details. I get into it in the book where they concocted these ideas. But you see uh, six representatives here. Uh, you probably heard of Pachycetus, or Pachycetus uh, and you probably also heard of uh, Ambulocetus is one that a lot of times talk about. It's the middle one, uh, becoming a whale. How it became a whale, again, I go through it in the book. I'm not going to bore you with the details here, but it's almost comical if they weren't being serious. But what's interesting, uh, Tales of Walking Whales, uh, David Berlinski, for example, and other mathematicians have done the math. Uh, they're actually working on a different logarithm on to do a, another set within a computer. But he said that he stopped on the whale at 50,000. That's 50,000 morpho morphological changes that would have happened from step one to the whale, not six. And again, if, let's just say hypothetically, roll with me. Let's just say that this first one changed just a little bit. It kept going into the water and just changed just a little bit, uh, Lamarckism style. But, uh, I'm kidding. But uh, then all of a sudden it changes just a little bit. Well, we should have that in the fossil record. Then it changes a little more. We should have a ton of those fossils. Changes a little bit more. 50,000. We should have a lot more than just a handful of bones that they say, well, we think. And the only reason they even think that is because what they'll say, and, and they change it all the time because they'll be digging up fossil and they'll say, well, this one seemed to kind of stop. And this one kind of seems to be here. This one surely didn't become extinct. So you know what? I bet this one turned into this one. That's what they say when they're saying, oh, we've got plenty of snake uh, uh, evidence in the fossil record or whale. Uh, it, it's absolutely false. And again, it's funny, the, uh, you see the blue highlighted part, that's the only piece of uh, Ambulocetus that they had. And they concocted that entire uh, drawing in Science Magazine, uh, I think it was in the 80s, what does it say? Yeah, 83. So again, you get a handful of uh, bones, you say, you know what? That became a whale. Again, push these, push them more. And again, we can't go in, I, I can do an all day talk just on, uh, Darwinism, man evolution. You know, you've heard the primates again. Why is there, uh, uh, you know, primates basically over time branched out. Some became more like the, you know, gorillas, apes, chimp chimpanzees. Others went a different direction. And you have all these different steps that became you and I and our cousins. Uh, the great apes branched off into a different direction. Again, completely fallacious. It's, it's completely an assertion. Uh, no reason at all to think that. And again, just think about, again, when you're taking your notes, made in God's image. That is odd that we're conscious, uh, we're sentient as far as, uh, you know, the great apes, they do uh, think things through, I'm sure, but they're not going to produce Hamlet. They're not going to say, why is there something rather than nothing, I wonder. So again, you would think there would at least be a, a group of maybe talking bear-like creatures, very primitive, but basic language, uh, if, if this kind of theory was true. But you see man, kind, completely separated out. And again, uh, some of my colleagues uh, at Logos uh, just released uh, Contested Bones. Awesome book. I've got some in the back, uh, and if anybody wants one, I'll get you a copy. Uh, if we run out, uh, full color photos, which really adds to it, but they basically go through all of the alleged, uh, the major, like Lucy and all the major uh, uh, hominids, where they're saying, well, we think this is a transitional, and they basically lay out using completely uh, the secular literature, and they actually even interviewed uh, Richard Leakey, the founder of Lucy, and said, look, do we get your story right? He said, yeah, you got it. And he is not a friend of uh, creationists or Christians, but so it wasn't like they just, uh, I mean, they concocted, or they, it wasn't like they just concocted this. They got this from the best uh, sources around. So these just so stories that you always hear, you'll see it in Barnes and Noble and all these on the magazine shelf. Evolutionists have physics envy. 
They tell the public that the science behind evolution is the same science that sent people to the moon and cures diseases. It's not. The science behind evolution is not empirical, not empirical, but forensic, historic. Because evolution took place in history, its scientific investigations are after the fact. No testing, no observation, no repeatability, no falsification, nothing at all like physics. I think this is what the public discerns, that evolution is just a bunch of just-so stories disguised as legitimate science. And that's coming from GeoTimes. And I couldn't agree more. Again, these just-so stories that you'll hear, kind of concluding this part of it, the origin of the universe, again, Nobel Prize winning physicist. When you hear or read anything about the birth of the universe, someone is making it up. Well, but about life, you know, Time Magazine, how life began. Again, nobody understands the origin of life, and if they say they do, they are probably trying to fool you. Keep that in mind with your professors, too. I'm not trying to get anyone in trouble, but this is I, almost every single time they get their back against the wall. And sometimes I'm not confrontational. I'll just ask them questions and let them answer, and they'll just storm off. Again, two world views in conflict. You can't piece these two together. The universe exploded into existence out of nothing. In the Bible, or in the beginning, God created. Life evolved from a pool of chemicals by natural processes. God created all life. Different life forms evolved from a common ancestor over millions of years. God created life after its kind. Again, on your notes, as far as which one makes a better theory, keep in mind, Doug Axe, common science, common sense, and again, I'm, I'm using the, the common science. That doesn't mean dumbed down. Again, you're talking a, a very high-level operational science uh, scientist in Dr. Axe, but I'm just saying that common sense tells us this, and then when we get really into the details, it tells us it even more. Again, this is at the uh, talk that I was at, uh, the universal design intuition. As maker of things, we instantly recognize things that were made, and we know these things can't be made without know-how. And again, Richard Dawkins himself, we must always remind ourselves that things that look designed really aren't. Again, I think we always have to remind ourselves that the emperor does have clothes. It's what they're having to do. Emperor's naked. I'm sure you know the emperor has no clothes expression. And they keep saying, nope, he's got clothes on, he's got clothes on. And again, Richard Dawkins' own words. In a garden with its beautiful birds and bees, of course it's natural to think there's a gardener. Any fool is likely to think there must be a gardener. The huge achievement of Darwin was to show that this didn't have to be true. Of course it's difficult. Of course it had to wait until the mid-19th century before anybody thought of it. It just seems so obvious that if you've got a garden, there must be a gardener. But Darwin showed that that wasn't the case. Do you like my uh, attempted uh, rendition of uh, Dawkins? Again, Alvin Plantinga, properly basic beliefs. I'm not going to go into that, but the fact that, you know, it's a properly basic belief. It's not provable that, you know, we really exist. He's basically saying all the science, belief in God, and this design intuition that Douglas Axe was talking about is, qualifies as a properly basic belief as well. But that's not all. Uh, 2016, the Royal Society in uh, the UK had a conference. Now, this is the hardcore evolutionists that like, uh, naturalist evolutionists that like worship Darwin. I mean, it's literally a religion uh, with them. And they came together to say, guys, we can't keep giving these old dogmatic answers and we can't, we can't keep everybody at bay, like the intelligent design guys and the creationists. We got too many holes. So they were even saying uh, in this conference, we've got to come up with something because natural selection and, and uh, working, working out to get new life forms, it's not coming together. So they didn't. They left without having a possible replacement theory. So they just said, "Well, let's just 
I guess we'll just keep pushing this on the public, but it's interesting that they even came together to say, all right, guys, this is getting embarrassing. We've got to do something. Again, pillars of naturalism. Freud is dead. Marx is dead. Darwin isn't feeling very well. So again, it opens up an entire realm of uh, possibilities, research, and everything else once we move past naturalism, if we can ever get them there. I'm not going to show this little video. It's running out of time. Intelligent Design 3.0. Again, intelligent design, properly understood, is basically the belief that there is uh, design in life everywhere we see. Now, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't say who the designer is or what it is, but it does necessitate that there is uh, a designer of some sort, not naturalism, not blind chance, not luck. And they really came a long way. Uh, in the 80s, Darwin on trial, Philip E. Johnson really kind of kicked it off. Uh, Darwin's Black Box, that really put it on the map, Michael Behe. Um, in, uh, I think it was 96 or 97, uh, again, William Dembski, The Design Revolution, uh, that was, I think, about 2001. Stephen Meyer, talked about before, I'm just actually rereading back through this book, Signature in the Cell, DNA uh, and Evidence uh, for Intelligent Design from an Information Level. Uh, David Berlinski, The Devil's Delusion, a great example there as well. Again, already talked about Darwin's Doubt, uh, Stephen Meyer on the Cameron Explosion, Undeniable. Uh, they just released a book. I haven't read through all of it. It's like a thousand pages, but it's on the incompatibility of theistic evolution. It's a great point, and this is good for the Christians out there. Basically, what they're saying is evolution's dead, so why would you try and keep a dead theory still going if it's not, you know, if it's not, if it's not working for the public, why would you try to say, well, God used evolution? And they, they, it's just a great book. And then in October, he's coming out with uh, the return of the God hypothesis. So I'm very excited to see that. All right. So again, conclusions here. Ultimate authority, the Bible. Again, 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give an answer. Uh, 50 to 75% of Christian students walk away from their faith before leaving college just because they're not prepared. And again, you're probably going to say, well, why the Bible? We get no naturalism, and that's where I'm getting into quickly now. Uh, but again, contingency, Big Bang, biogenesis, fine-tuning, all science, naturalism, uh, neo-Darwinism, or theism, and the Bible. I think that it goes without question that naturalism does not account for these adequately. So what you're seeing here is kind of a cumulative case come together, and with that, you're seeing a table that has five good legs on it, but there's actually a lot more because it gets much worse for the naturalists. So again, morality. We're not really going to go into this one. We don't have time. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Objective moral values do exist. Some things really are good and evil. And it's funny that I'll see protests. People are like, no, there's no such thing as meaning or purpose. And I'm like, well, why are you protesting? So in other words, it, it, it's kind of, again, an intuition, you know, hurting someone for fun, it's objectively wrong. And if, this, if that's true, God exists necessarily because it has to have a grounding for that morality. And again, twisting that around for evil. There's some things that are really evil. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Evil exists. Therefore, objective moral values exist because some things truly are evil. What Hitler did was evil. Well, therefore, it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. And again, the Bible does give a good ontological basis for this and would be happy you know, to skip that video. Again, information theory, uh, this in itself would deserve a talk, but it's basically where does all of the information come from? Because when you're looking at, you know, a cell today compared to, say, Darwin's day, uh, like in uh, Berlinski, he said, you know what? He said, it's it's like a galaxy. And in Darwin's day, it was a glob of slime. So, I mean, the inner workings and the complexity are just insane. And it's just amazing how much information is in our cell. 
And if you compare this, you can see just one little cell, if you could pick it up like that. It's amazing the amount of information that's in there. Your instructions, the complexity of life. Again, these are things we're just scratching the surface. I've got a bunch of material on the website, uh, and I cover at a pretty good level in the philosophy of history book. But again, the naturalist is still going to have to say chance, necessity, luck. And that seems to be their answer on everything. And again, if you did, uh, you probably heard that analogy, uh, oh, the BioLogos guy, uh, Collins, uh, Francis Collins, when they mapped the, the genome and they basically were saying that, you know, what the, what the instructions of your life would end up being would be stack it all the way to the moon. And somehow this happened by chance. Again, math, the applicability of math. I don't, I don't know if you guys saw about the, the, the logarithms that kind of mapped out uh, what, it, what the black hole would look like uh, I was, when I was in Utah. So it was a couple of days ago, I think. But again, the applicability of math seems to almost necessitate uh, because the applicability of math is not due to a coincidence. And the logical answer there would seem to imply God. Uh, uh, Edward Frankel, um, his book, oh, he's a math genius, it's something about New York bestseller, Love of Math or something, but uh, you know, he grew up secular in Soviet Union, and even in his book he says, man, it, the, the way the, the you know, math comes together, there's some kind of design here, there's some kind of a reality beyond naturalism. He didn't name God, but it, it's a logical conclusion. Again, not going to cover that either, but arts and aesthetics, this is a incredible strong point. Why, just like morality, why is it that some things truly are beautiful and some things are, uh, I mean, where does that ontology, that foundation of art come from? When I talk to artists, I've been working with them a lot more lately, and I'm like, do you think you're just, there's any purpose in what you're doing? Well, of course they do. And again, that begs the question, why? Oh, I'd love to talk about those more, but I'm going to skip through those. So anyway, all right, non-naturalism. The reality from the naturalist, luck, bang, explosion, or revolution. Why is there anything at all? Again, the uh, origins of the universe, biogenesis, neo-Darwinism, morality, ethics, desire, purpose, civilization. We're going to be talking about a little bit later, religion, the Bible. These all seem to line up very good uh, on a biblical creation standpoint, or let's just say a creation standpoint, not a naturalistic one. Uh, oh, also purpose, naturalism. We create meaning for ourselves, there, so it's all subjective. There is no meaning in anything, kind of like we we're talking about. But non-naturalism, yes, there is a meaning. So again, opening lines of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And this, this set, system of setup that's mentioned in Genesis seems to make more sense than the, you know, secular just say, what's a bang? Well, what about all this life? What's well, explosion? Okay, well, what about all the, the civilization? Well, you see, it was a Neolithic revolution. And again, it, when you hear these words like that, it's usually your, your warning receptor should go on. So again, is truth dead? Is God dead? Is God coming back to life? So again, inference to the best explanation, I really think, I'm not going to go back through these, but I think that the, uh, the naturalism, naturalist, or the neo-Darwinist, usually they're one and the same, dead in the water. Theism accounts for all of these beautifully, specifically biblical theism. And again, there's a lot more I could go into, and, uh, but we're just scratching the surface here based on the time restraints. And I still will hear probably somebody say more white noise, but I don't believe in atheism. Psalm 14.1. The fool says in his heart there is no God. That's Psalms 14.1. And I don't think any of you are fools. Again, we do have a museum uh, that covers a lot of these things, uh, has a lot of first-hand artifacts, uh, Right, I had all these in here. 
Uh, we've had just over 15,000 visitors. Uh, and again, we work with a bunch of other groups. Uh, also, you can see some really cool stuff, even if you don't like the, the biblical part. Uh, first editions of all the major Bibles. Uh, I mean, the, a Gutenberg, one page of a Gutenberg uh, cost 100000 Now, that's not mine, obviously, but that's part of the group I work with. But no, all these artifacts, uh, this, this part of the museum I run, and they supply me with volunteers, thankfully, since I have a corporate job. But uh, a lot of these are authentic. We've got a lot of visitors, like I said, just over 15,000 in three years. Uh, you know, Gutenberg Press. I mean, these are things, artifacts, history that we can all get into. And again, would love to uh, have your group show up. I will personally walk you through every exhibit if you would like. And again, the, the Noah's Ark was donated to us by a, a group of uh, Chinese Christians. Uh, interesting story, but I won't go into it. Also, we have a lot of speakers come in. Uh, the fossil replicas we have are actually from Bones and Clones, which are the is the same one that does all the major universities. So it's not, you know, cheap knockoffs. But uh, we got all the major replicas uh, and whatnot. So again, at this point, when we're looking through these, we should definitely be able to mark neo-Darwinism off the list. Well, there's no point if it's false to try to say God did it, so scratch that one off the list. And really, I don't think there's any reason to say I just don't know. So that leaves us with intelligent design or creationism. And now we're going to kind of very quickly discuss, okay, why go ahead and bridge the gap and say it's creationism? And... Oh, sorry. Again, Occam's razor. Uh, basically, and it's pretty much a tool that states that entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. Naturalism fails on every level of Occam's razor because you have to assume so much uh, nonsense. And again, I'm excited that uh, Stephen Meyer, a big uh, founding member of the intelligent design movement, talked with him a lot before. He's actually uh, coming out with the return of the God Hypothesis. I don't think it ever went away, but uh, in October. So I think we're going to fly up there for that. So again, I hope you're marking those little lists down. But I mean, the evidence is, I think, overwhelming. And again, another question. Don't take my word for it. These are all on YouTube. Why is it that it seems like the creation uh, side always wins these big debates? And I'm not just saying that. In the, in the William Lane Craig versus Christopher Hitchens debate, even all the atheist sites, uh, uh, was it common sense atheism was a big one or something like that? But anyway, it uh, it said that uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens was spanked like a foolish child. I just remember that one because it was a interesting way to quote it. Uh, again, uh, most people say that John Lennox uh, handled Dawkins pretty handily. Gary Habermas, did Jesus really rise from the dead? These debates are all on YouTube, so don't take my word for it. But But naturalism... I think is well out of date. So the fact that we're still trudging it along is, uh, is sad, really. All right, part three, the philosophy of history, a rational discussion. A simple and better toe? Well, if you don't know toe, that's theory of everything. Um, and again, keep in mind when you're looking at, you know, whether it's the Charles Lyles, the the Richard Dawkins, uh, thinking, well, creation, Big Bang, okay, geology, um, quest for the historical Jesus, that was uh, early 20th century. Well, we got the Enlightenment. Well, you know, that was quite a while back. Are we still hanging on to some really outdated methodologies? Maybe naturalism really is an outdated methodology. And again, I have seen it stunt so much education because you can't follow the evidence where it leads. You're, you're corridored off on these silly, uh, like I said, I mean, again, in the Q&A, please blow me out of the water. I always encourage the, the uh, audience to do that if what I'm saying is fallacious in some area. Free your mind, Neo, in the Matrix. <laughs> but, uh, but again, a lot of times I'm asked, okay, well, what about peer review? Okay, well, what's interesting with a lot of the peer review is the prerequisite is that naturalism is true. So then they're like, well, I haven't seen a lot of non-naturalistic theories. Well, first of all, there is, I think, over, it's like 120 peer-reviewed 
uh, intelligent design ones. My group, Logos Research, has a bunch of peer-reviewed stuff. But first of all, who cares? It goes back to the common science that uh, uh, Douglas Axe was talking about. But most of these journals, it necessitates naturalism as a prerequisite. So if, I'm, if I've got a really good non-naturalistic hypothesis, well, I, I, it's already going to get rejected. Uh, so again, um, 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is common sense, even if there became a journal that was against you know, math. So, uh, so again, that's, that's part of the piece that is a little bit of a misnomer when you hear that. But just for the record, I don't think it matters. But yes, uh, Logos Research Associates, uh, lots of peer-reviewed, uh, Discovery Institute. Uh, they, I, I think it's literally like 120. It's something like that, which is actually quite a few considering they are so blackballed from the, from the outset. And again, Expelled. Still a very relevant uh, DVD, even though it's 10 years old now. Um, I, it's free on YouTube, and grab a copy in the back. It really goes through a lot of this, uh, what I'm saying, at a very entertaining level, because Ben Stein's great. Uh, again, free your mind and think. Indoctrination begins at a very early age. Uh, and what's interesting here, even if, uh, I didn't bring that up, but even if naturalism somehow was true, we'd never know it. Like if we were just literally dirt and then we evolved into you and me, how could I ever trust my brain in the first place? You see what I mean? Because it, it could have evolved wrong. But anyway, that's what I thought when I saw brainwash. And again, another thing that I thought was interest, uh, interesting is revenue. Uh, about $150 billion in 2017 donation alone went to a lot of the uh, science uh, groups like this university and others, uh, 10 million average university, uh, sorry, $10 million average university science departments will get once you mesh all those out. The Discovery Institute, the entire total revenue of them is about 5 million. Answers in Genesis, uh, I didn't think it was that much, but maybe it is 25 million. But either way, I was thinking it was closer to 10, but I'll have to double check that. But either way, they've got a tiny revenue and they're still slaying Goliath. Can you imagine if it was a square footing? And what's interesting, again, it's about a thousand page book, The Nature of Nature, Examining the Role of Naturalism in Science. Fantastic book, again, showing that naturalism is, is, is false. Uh, the Discovery Institute tried and they actually got a university to buy in to say, you know what, this makes sense. We're going to actually set up a laboratory, and I forgot the university, uh, to really give intelligent design a run for its money. Let's see if this is, let's see if there's some plausibility here. And then the ACLU and all the other natural science areas got involved and was able to get it shut down. So it's funny that you'll hear people, you know, like the Eugenie Scott and these people, well, why aren't they doing some good science? Now they do have their own science area uh, in a few areas, Seattle, I think they've got one in Brazil because uh, they're a little bit more on the academic freedom than they are in the United States, unfortunately. And they've got a couple of other smaller ones in my group. Uh, Logos researchers also does do, but, uh, but they're very simplified. Uh, and I just thought it was funny that a university, a major university was saying, you know what, let's go ahead and really give intelligent design. Let's see if it, what it can produce. And then they came in and said, no, you won't. And they shut it down. What are they so scared of? I think they're scared because they know naturalism is false. But they can't allow, uh, who was it that made that quote? Can't remember, but it was, uh, was it Thomas Nagel? I can't remember, but anyway, uh, was made the comment that we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, no matter the evidence. So again, which is science? And, and neither are both. And more importantly, I think the better question is which is true? Arbitrary, inconsistent preconditions. Which one of that does that really sound more like? And again, this is the last one I'll show in here. Great conversation. This was a, a Jordan Peterson and Susan Blackmore. Susan Blackmore, hardcore Richard Dawkins fan, a friend. And uh, his stance, because he's not a Christian to my knowledge, but he said, you're not an atheist. And um, he peeled back these layers, like all this stuff she's doing. He's like, why are you doing this? 
And then she was kind of caught off guard. And she's like, well, I, I have to pretend to give myself meaning, I guess. But, but I think that's a good example. I mean, unless, I mean, most people are not really atheistic, at least not all the time, thank you, Lord. And again, that begs the question, why? And I think if we're made in God's image, but we all have the same evidence, the evolutionist or naturalist as well as the creationist. And apparently we can't handle the truth they tell us. But uh, uh, Logos researchers, they participated in, they were the ones that kind of put the Is Genesis History together. Met the director this last uh, weekend and everything. And again, I highly encourage you to watch that because again, it, it's got good history and it's also covers a lot of the geology, some of the stuff we're not going to get into quite as much. But again, these just so stories, uh, the origin of man, you know, even this, when somebody alludes to millions and billions of years, I don't know how accurate, uh, maybe it is, maybe it's not, I really don't know, but there are a lot of problems uh, with just saying a billion years ago this happened. A billion? That's a long time. And again, you'll see these uh, lots of inconsistencies. I'm not going to really get into them a lot here, but even within the geological record. And we can actually do some good testing when we have something like uh, Mount St. Helens. I've got a great video that kind of showing that in a, uh, a big uh, uh, flood in Iceland that kind of shows some of the things that a, a creationist would expect to see on the biblical account. And again, there are these just so stories, not really gonna get into this part a lot. I would love to though during the uh, uh, us hanging out this afternoon. But again, uh, not gonna go into this a lot, but carbon-14, you've probably heard of it, et cetera, how they will test the half-life. Well, it's interesting that, you know, a lot of times it'll be freshly made lava, and of course it tests to be, you know, four or five million years old, and we're like, and everybody's, no, it's actually a year old. We know, we actually saw this one. Oh, sorry. Also, all these rocks have carbon in it. Technically, after just, oh, what is the date? Something like 100,000 years, there shouldn't be any carbon. So they always say, well, the samples are just contaminated. Same thing with dinosaur bones. They, they all have carbon in it. And it's like, well, if it's got carbon, I don't think it can be 75 million years old. But, well, it got contaminated. All of them? Yeah, all of them. Okay, well, that's interesting. Well, some of these weren't fossilized. Well, I'm sure there's a reason. And it's fine that they contain carbon? Yeah, it's probably just contaminated. Well, there's actually red blood cells they've now found starting, uh, oh, about 20 years ago, and these were non-creationists. And now it's funny because they started to look in all of the dinosaur bones, and a lot of them have its spongy red blood cells. So again, it's, it's interesting that, wow, it looks fresh. So these were able to stay good for 75 million years? Yeah, and they've thrown some again, some speculative theories on how it could happen and maybe it is i don't know i mean i don't really have a, a horse in the race but i do think we should think about it critically thinking creationism creation science intelligent design evolution and again some good perspectives here somebody says well what is what would a creationist pr uh, predict well okay let's just use a junk dna as an example uh one of my friends jonathan dr jonathan wells uh and some others uh uh discovered, you know, because on a naturalistic viewpoint, they said, well, this DNA, the human genome, most of it's junk. Well, that would seem wasteful if a creator would have, that was their argument, made so much junk. Well, guess what? This was a 1972 junk DNA was coined. Well, as of today, we've already encoded that over 80% of the genome is functional. So again, it's not junk DNA, and this is a, not junk DNA, and this is the book, uh, Myth of Junk DNA, we've got in the back. Uh, again, Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, argues the opposite, and guess what? The creationist was right. Same thing, uh, Sternberg, uh, Buried Alive, there were some things with Neanderthal that Jack Kuoza, Kuoza did, and he said, you know what, I think these are uh, humans, they're related, they're, there's... And everybody, of course, said, oh, you're an idiot. Well, then they mapped the Neanderthal genome. It's almost the same as ours. 
and almost all of us have Neanderthal in us. So again, the creationist was right. Uh, great two-volume set. Uh, I spent a ton of time climbing up in the uh, uh, Grand Canyon area uh, this past weekend with some geologists. And again, Earth's catastrophic past. There's a lot of good evidence. I can't go into much of it here because I'm already about to run out of time. But uh, on a global flood, there really is uh, miracles. I mean, and a lot of these are peer-reviewed as far as a two-volume set by Craig Keener. Um, the only reason people do this knee-jerk reaction against miracles is because, well, naturalism is true. Well, what if naturalism's not true? Oh, well, then a lot of these accounts of miracles are probably accurate. And again, tons of it in here, and even a lot of the uh, secularists are saying, you know what, he's got some good points. And again, I went to a secular university, and that was a lot of my findings. They didn't like it, and it made, uh, you know, it made my final research project much more challenging. But even at a secular university, I, I, I fought them with evidence, and I ended up winning. And ended up, uh, I was trying to get a 4 point, got a 3.9. So I'm just saying that, not to brag, I'm saying that I, I stuck with the facts, and I stuck with the evidence, and it was against naturalism. And I still was able to get a good grade. And yes, I we can handle the truth. So again, many layers in the Grand Canyon I was just talking about. There's man's theories. There's also a biblical theory. So again, keep this in mind when we're interpreting facts. Same thing with ape versus man. We're all interpreting facts, and I believe that the Bible gives a good, sound judgment on these. And this is actually interesting. I brought this for you guys to look at. It's a, I was reviewing it for somebody. Uh, the New Apologetics Bible, great stuff in there. And it takes a very open stance. Again, we kind of went through this before. Almost every major area of science was founded by a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, all these scientific disciplines. Uh, and honestly, I got a lot more into my studies when I looked at it as a creationist standpoint. So again, a better and a simpler theory of everything. There's the book, Edward Frankel on Love and Math. Uh, I truly believe the social sciences, the humanities, what I'm a big part in, as well as the natural sciences, archaeology, uh, anthropology, all of these form a much holist better holistic view, a theory of everything, from a biblical perspective that can account for literally everything than naturalism. And of course, what you're going to hear from the internet atheist and the uh, uh, internet infidel, that one guy who doesn't know much, is this kind of thing. Mythology. Well, today it's religion. Tomorrow it's a fable. Again, this is white noise. It's nonsense. So now, why the Bible? Okay, first of all, from my uh, reference point as an ancient historian, really, the Bible is the only uh, religion that's historic in scope. Like in my philosophy of religion studies, you know, I studied Hinduism, Buddhism, and uh, a lot of them, you know, God's fighting in the heavens. Well, even if it's true, we couldn't know. The Bible is literally within history. So we can test it. We can look at it. Also, it's not one person based. It's not all based on Muhammad. It's not all based on Joseph Smith. It's not all based, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's uh, at least 40 authors ranging a huge period of time, all aligning on a, on a one point, one story, and it all comes together, and uh, beautifully. And then again, I'm not going to get much into it, but the, the prophecies piece, I mean, it's amazing. Even a secularist, when they line those up, even the ones that they're, throw out the ones that they're like, well, this is too vague. Okay, throw those out. They're saying it's impossible that, you know, Jesus is able to, I mean, it's too improbable, but it happened, that uh, foretelling of Jesus, the resurrection, etc. It's testable. It's not relativistic. Pluralism is implausible. I hear people say, well, all religions are the same. No, they're actually not because they're fundamentally different. I mean, if, if true Theravada Buddhism is atheistic in scope, Muhammad from Islam specifically said there was, uh, there, uh, that Christ is not the Son of God. Well, the Bible says he is the Son of God. 
Um, so, I mean, th these, these can't be uh, the same. So, I mean, again, written over three continents, three different languages. And again, my background in ancient history, it is universally recognized. And this part I love. Qualitatively and quantitatively, this is the best ancient history book we've got anywhere. And a lot of the atheists hate that because they say, no, it's not. I say, all right, hit me with it. What's, what's your book, Homer? And of course, they don't have one. So their argument, which, okay, it's valid. They say, fine, it is the best quantitatively and qualitatively uh, history book that we've got in ancient history. But it doesn't make it true. Okay, that's fine. Uh, are you willing to throw out everything else? Cicero, uh, Plutarch, everybody else? Well, no. Consistency. Again, Dr. Sabo Pandit, I posted him a lot. He tells his journey from India. He spent 10 years and he got through his doctorate on is there a God, came to the conclusion there has to be, spent another 10 years, okay, what God is it? And he breaks down why Christianity is the only one that really makes sense. I've got his DVDs in the back free. Also, it's on the website. I'll let him go through it, uh, searchseminars.org. Again, the importance of Genesis 1 through 11, I'm gonna go through this real quick. Uh, archaeology uh, has brought huge confirmation to every part of the Bible. Uh, and again, in some ways, the chapters is Francis Schaeffer, Genesis 1 through 11 are the most important ones in the Bible for they put man in the cosmic setting and show him his particular uniqueness. They explain man's wonder and yet his flaws. And without a proper understanding of these chapters, we have no answer to the problems of metaphysics, morals, or epistemology. And furthermore, the work of Christ becomes one more upper story religious answer, and that is uh, that comparison of upper story, lower story. All right, I'm speeding up. Again, Genesis 1 through 11, a fall, flood, tower, genealogy. you got to be kidding me, right? Creation by God, Noah's flood, Tower of Babel, Adam and Eve. How old are they? Again, uh, Neil Tyson. God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that gets smaller and smaller as time goes on. Again, don't get me started. The fairy tale of Tower of Babel. Old Testament Genesis or Old uh, Genesis six through nine. A six hundred year old man builds a wooden boat that houses millions of animals. Ha ha ha. These are all white noise. Don't let them upset you because it's all hinging on naturalism, which is defeated. It's done. It's logical positivism. It's just trying now to sweep it under the rug. And again, all of these chapters give answers to the things we've been covering. Uh, creation ex nihilo, creation of life, creation of man, fall of man, Noah's flood, animals, language, genealogy, civilization, uh, the biblical accuracy. It's the best history book we've got, quality and quantity. And if we just look at a few of these, for example, Creation Ex Nihilo, uh, Klaus uh, Westermann, I think it's German, so I'm probably mispronouncing it, analyzed this. And again, he wasn't, uh, he, he's one of the most respected uh, Greek scholars out there. And uh, I'm sorry, Hebrew scholars. Sorry, I was looking at the time. I know I'm about to run out. And uh, he said, there is no ifs, ands, or buts. This is the only account of a creation that is a true creation ex nihilo out of nothing and it's funny because the bible used to get ridiculed and then it turns out guess what it is true that's exactly accurate and again just kind of going back into the the abara the the hebrew word for creation again cambrian explosion genesis 125 god made the beast of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind we'll hit on that in just a minute and everything that creeps upon the earth after its kind, God saw that it was good. Adam and Eve, obviously, uh, Science and Human Origins, Casey Luskin, Doug Axe, Ann Gager uh, did a book. Uh, some other colleagues are working on one as well. Adam was a historical person. And the genetics, uh, two of the people from Logos Researches, uh, Dr. Sanford and uh, Rob Carter here, are putting a book together currently uh, on this very fact from a genetic standpoint, as far as Adam and Eve truly being real people. And, and I mean, that's amazing. It traces back and it matches up with the Bible. And again, here's Rob Carter's uh, Mitochondrial Eve and the Three Daughters of Noah. Uh, I think we've got some back there as well. 
Again, this is kind of a misnomer. You hear about the 98% chimp to human DNA singular or similarity. First of all, it's closer to uh, last I heard, because they take segments, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but they take these little segments and then they just look at those and say, look how accurate they are. But it's closer to 80, I'm sorry, 84, 85. But again, keep in mind, we're 80 with a cow. We're 90 with a, we're actually closer related to a cat. Uh, I'm sorry, it was maybe it was 91. Either way, I've got that on the, the website. Uh, humans share 50% of their DNA with bananas. Again, a common designer, not a common descent, would make a lot more holistic sense. And again, ancient history in the DNA. What's funny is when you look at these paths where everybody, they, you know, the secular say we spread out, it matches exactly with uh, the flood. What we can say with a fair scientific certainty is that every man alive today descended from one man and every human alive today descended from one woman. And that's from a secularist. Where do all the races come from? Well, the Bible has an answer for that. We're all one race. So we're all made in the image of God. There's only one race, the human race. We think of races, we typically think of distinctions related to traits of skin color, eye shape, etc. There's only two-tenths of a percent genetic difference between any two humans anywhere on the earth. Only 6% of that 0.2% difference is related to racial traits. So again, we all have the exact same skin coloring. It's the melanin levels that change. And again, don't need to go into this. You guys know basic genetics as far as how that's going to come out. Freckles, dark, whatever. That's why you'll see sometimes a... a like a completely Caucasian, say, woman and a uh, African uh, male, uh, woman male, and they have a completely Caucasian child. It's it's just to do with the genetics itself, but, but it's no different race. Yeah, here it is. Here's the exact same example. I hear my phone going off. I know I'm out of time. So again, one family tree. This is a very logical, consistent, and it uh, holistically makes sense. We look at the history behind the Bible, the Sumerian king list. We actually see, guess what? Wow, there's 10 uh, uh, rulers that lived these ridiculously long lives. Well, the Bible had some people living long too, right? Yeah, it was same number if you're counting uh, Adam to Noah. Hmm, well, that's interesting. And again, these uh, you also have within uh, the Gilgamesh saga. He talks about... There's a big flood, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you're, if you're looking at the flood being about that 3200 B.C. time range, not only does that align with uh, the Indian records, but it also aligns with Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh was a real king. Uh, so a flood and a tower. There are over 270. Uh, Hancock Graham, I think, estimates that it's closer to 400 flood legends that are very similar. So the global flood is the best historical, as a historian, event that we have on record. I mean, and these cultures were, they didn't overlap. So, I mean, these were places all over the world that are recording a global flood with animals of some type in a big boat, which, which is remarkable. I guarantee you, you're not hearing about this in your uh, Western civilization class, if they even teach that anymore. So, and also, if you think about uh, where the ark was, uh, mountains of Arafat, where everybody spread out, according to the Bible, it matches exactly with what the secularists tell us how we spread out. Of course, they're going to say, of course, no, it wasn't no, uh, you know, flood or anything. But again, it matches up with the data. <clears throat> so the biblical account is spot on. Dispersion after Babel. And again, civilization exploding at once, language writing uh, being, you know, completely intact makes sense from a biblical standing point. The naturalist historian has to throw in the Neolithic revolution because they're like, you know, it's crazy. They all seem to be, they seem to come fully formed. Civilization, language writing, it didn't seem to evolve. Well, yeah, guess what? It probably didn't. Again, what about all the animals? Not going to go into this too much. You've probably heard it before. The Bible says after their kind. Again, what exactly is a kind? Well, I would say 
probably one dog kind. Again, I don't know, maybe two or three, but each one of these you can get through a few generations. Uh, and again, there is crossbreeding, but there's not transitions. You can get a zonkey between a zebra and a donkey. You can get a liger between a lion and a tiger. But again, what you're not going to get is a uh, langaroo, you know, a lion and a kangaroo, or, or any of these other things that you would kind of expect to see, all jokes aside, you would expect to see these transitions where they start changing from one kind to another. You don't see that, and that matches very well with the biblical account. And again, repopulation. And again, here's the, the typical atheist I'm picturing. I shouldn't say that. It's not all, but some of the ones that get like the angry atheist. When you don't believe in God, but you spend three-fourths of your life trying to debunk that he exists. That is a good question. And again, John Sanford, touching on genetics really quick. Uh, these are secular scientists. Uh, Sanford's not, but here. Um, why are we not dead 100 times over? We have basically, and I'm going to go this really quick, uh, our basically genetic entropy, which means, and it makes sense with an Adam and Eve model, we're basically breaking down every generation. And his point, the secular's point in this article is, why aren't we dead 100 times over if we're really, you know, a million years old or uh, three million years old, whatever it is, then what we should be. So what, and of course they allude to like, well, the entropy probably wasn't as bad back then. Well, there's no reason to think it wasn't. And it traces back to a very solid biblical model. And again, uh, Dr. Sanford, who I work with, The Waiting Time Problem in a Model Hominid Population, his book, Genetic Entropy, we have some in the back. If you look at the model of those lifespans of Noah and his descendants, it follows the same cadence to where you can see these long lives are probably, I mean, why, why should we think that they were that fictional? I mean, the further back we go, those genetics were probably perfect. And then just like secular scientists show today, everything is breaking down. Why aren't we uh, dead a thousand times over? So genetic, genetic entropy, this is basically us falling apart. Again, language and writing, I cover that pretty detailed in uh, the philosophy of history book. Again, they just make these guesses about language and writing evolving. What we don't see is this. We don't see grunts and groans and scribbles turning into writing. We see pretty much a fully diverse language and uh, uh, writing system coming about at the uh, pretty much the, that what they would call the dawn of civilization, which also would fall right in line with the accounts like Noah's flood and the dating of the Tower of Babel, etc. And people are inevitably going to ask, so I'm just going to go ahead and clear the air, have it all out in the open right now. Are you hinting that the creation may be younger? Yes. Now, I don't really have a horse in the race. I'm much more like Francis Schaeffer. I'm an agnostic on it. It doesn't matter to me if, if 10,000 years ago everything got created or 13.7 billion years ago. But as far as just a historian, there are some interesting parallels. I just put plus or minus 15,000 years ago or plus or minus about 14 billion, the conventional dating. Again, I, I don't have a horse in the race. But like Wayne Grudem says in Systematic uh, Theology, from a biblical perspective that we know Bibles got a lot of this stuff right, it would be on the younger side. No question. Ancient history, my field, without question, it's on the recent side. Uh, I mean, you, you mean going all the way back even to someone like Gilgamesh, you're seeing right there, that's about, that's about the beginning. And that's what they even say with the Neolithic Revolution. So extrapolating these millions and billions of years seems like a lot of fodder. Now, somebody will probably say, oh, yeah, flood geology. I think that is also much more on the side of a recent creation. A historical atom would be, just like the genetic entropy piece, would be on the young side. Now, cosmology, some of the young Earth side, that's why I tell you I make both sides mad, they've got good answers on measuring a starlight, becomes very speculative. But I would, you know, go ahead and put that on the older side, uh, or the 14 billion side. Genetics, like we talked about, uh, would necessitate a much more recent creation. So basically, and then finally, and most importantly, 
Naturalism itself, if it's dead, that was the only reason half of my Christian friends go with the 14 billion. Well, we've kind of got this leg in the pond. It's kind of old, but, but, or it's kind of naturalism, but I guess not naturalism, but we got God, but he's still kind of naturalistic. Uh, so again, I, I'm good taking the evidence where it leads. And like I said, I fall much more in the Francis Schaeffer camp, agnostic. I don't know. But I would say, as far as the evidence goes, the more recent does make, seem more tenable. And again, Creation, Evolution, Intelligent Design, good book giving all sides, old, young, theistic, uh, and uh, what was the other one? Oh, and then just an overview of intelligent design. And again, some people say, a recent creation, that's not credible. Actually, a lot more people are moving that way. I mean, J.P. Moreland, he, even though he does say 14 billion, he said that he really does think a lot of times that the recent creation may be the right way to go. Gary Habermas, he said uh, he's pretty much split down the middle. He said three days a week, I'm young earth, four days a week, I'm old earth. So in other words, I just think teach both sides. I mean, again, this is stuff we can agree to disagree on. I mean, again, at the end of the day, this is a, a little bit more of a, a finite point anyway, but somebody will inevitably ask, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to put that in there just to get, clear the air. But yes, there are great limits of science. We can't tell us exactly how old something is. All right, so the non-naturalistic side, you go through everything we've talked about so far today. Why is there anything at all? Uh, singularity, Big Bang, biogenesis, neo-Darwinism, civilization, religion, the Bible, art, ethics, desire. These seem to be inescapably much more on the side of creationism. And again, Genesis 1 through 11 does seem to answer most of these pretty well. So very quickly, what this would look like, just to give you a total uh, holistic scope, let's just say hypothetically 5,500. You've got a flood about 3,200. Uh, it says zero as far as uh, Christ. It'd really be more like 4 BC. And then you've got today. Old Testament, 1,500 to 400 BC range. New Testament, 40 to 100 AD range. You've got the fall of mankind. No point going over all that. And then just very quickly, just to kind of look at this holistically, you've got creation, fall, and I cover this in the Mere Christian Apologetics book, just high level. You've got a flood, you've got Cain, Abel, you've heard all of this. You've got the Tower of Babel, Shem, Ham, Japheth. You can see the repopulation piece. That, the dispersion into the world. Abraham, around 2000 BC. Isaac, Jacob, you've heard of all of them, I'm sure. You get to Egypt, you've got Moses. I'm sure you've probably at least seen the Charlton Heston version. Leads them out, that's the time of Joshua. We go into Judges, a little bit of turmoil. You finally get a monarchy with Saul, then it goes to King David, his son Solomon. Monarchy splits, that's why you have Judah, Israel. Eventually, uh, eventually we have uh, Judah, I'm sorry, Israel. The northern 10 tribes get conquered by Assyria. Uh, 726, I think and um, 726 BC, and then uh, Babylon conquers Judah, I think 586, and leads them off into captivity. That's when you have a lot of your prophets coming about, foretelling the time of Christ. They're released, come back, you have the revolt of the Maccabees, then you get to Matthew and the New Testament. Just giving you that overview, just to kind of put those facts together, because archaeology, has amazingly confirmed from a historic perspective so many of the uh, different uh, this, uh, periods of the Bible. And, and going way back, I had the privilege of uh, going to Oklahoma City a couple of weeks ago and I uh, was able to see, I'd already seen the, uh, the Jeremiah Bula, which is just the impression of two governors. It was just mentioned in Jeremiah and um, again, confirming the remarkable uh, detail of the Bible. Uh, and then the Isaiah Bula that says the prophet at the bottom and uh, also the Hezekiah one, you know, we're talking like 700 BC and the fact that these, these minute of level of details getting discovered are just amazing.
Just recently, I went and reviewed the uh, Moses controversy, uh, throwing out the outdated uh, Wellhausen documentary hypothesis, which I discuss in detail in the uh, philosophy of history book. Uh, so, I mean, these things are just keep coming more and more to light. Of course, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was, uh, you know, you're talking about dating before the time of Christ. And like the Isaiah scroll is literally, you look at it to today's Bible and it's uh, like 99% exactly the same with just a few minor spellings. So the Old Testament is amazing. New Testament gets even better. Gary Habermas, Minimal Facts. Again, I'm going to be talking to him tonight if anybody has any questions. These are the facts. I'm going to try to blow through them very quickly that we know. Uh, and he calls them the minimal facts. No scholar disagrees with them. Uh, and basically that that was, well, you can read them. Extra biblical sources, we have quite a few that confirm the same minimal facts that Gary Habermas is saying. And this is around specifically on the resurrection, for example, that he died by crucifixion. He was buried. Uh, his death caused the disciples to despair and lose hope. Tomb was empty and et cetera, et cetera. The church grew out. These are actually, though, able to be dated back very, very early as far as who Jesus is. And as far as the New Testament goes, when I told you it's the best qualitatively and quantitatively, we have all these random copies of, uh, let's say, for example, Homer is the best one we've got, but say Herodotus. It's 1,400 years almost be between the time, say, Herodotus wrote his, uh, Herodotus wrote his work and when we have it, 1,400 years. And we only have eight copies. So it's a good chance of what we have is not the most accurate. But, uh, and that's how all of ancient history is. The New Testament, though, just Greek manuscripts we have, and this one's a little bit out of date because we actually have 5,700, uh, and a lot of those date within plus or minus 50 years. And if you throw in the Latin, the Syrian, and uh, uh, Coptic, it's 24,000 manuscripts. So these numbers are mind-boggling. And again, so we have four options for historicity, a corrupt book of fiction, minimalist, maximalist, or inerrancy. I go through these in detail in my book. And uh, again, I, I just go to the maximalist position because again, as a historian, the inerrancy would, would take a little bit of a different level. So we're just going to look at that from a academic level as far as maximalist. How do we know the Bible's from God? Again, N.T. Wright has done some incredible work on the resurrection. And, um, and then his comment was, uh, I'm, I should have put it in here, I'm probably going to butcher it, but he basically said that um, not supporting something like, oh, people don't rise from the dead is scarecrows set up from the uh, Enlightenment time. And that it's time for us to move past that kind of a outdated methodology. So I agree. And I quote him quite a bit in the book. So again, minimal facts in the resurrection. We kind of went through these. Uh, James, Jesus' brother, uh, believed Jesus was raised. Now, that's interesting because he was an unbeliever. It's my brother. I don't believe he's the Messiah. All of a sudden, he becomes an early follower of the church and they and actually gets died a martyr. Admit that your brother really wasn't. We're going to throw you out the window. Throw me. So again, all of these are minimal facts that no scholar uh, really disputes with. A few will, but for the most part, not. And again, not going to go into a lot of detail here. It's on the site because I know I'm already over time. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, there's a creed there that dates to about within 15 months of uh, the resurrection itself. Even the, the, the skeptics will give you that. And what Gary Habermas means on the minimal facts piece, uh, oh yeah, this is basically all the historians agree with that. Uh, so real quickly, what do we know if we just took, because people will always mislabel, oh, it's the Bible. Well, if a historian looks at this as early first and second century documents, so, I mean, they're looking at it not as inerrancy. They're looking at it as historic documents. But even if you said, you know what, fine, take out your best sources. What do we know about Jesus? All right, we know that he lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar, lived a virtuous life, was a wonder worker, had a brother named Jesus, was acclaimed to be Messiah, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Uh, there was an ellipse and an 
earthquake that occurred when he died. He was crucified on the eve of the Jewish Passover. His disciples believed he rose from the dead. They were willing to die for their disbelief. Christianity spread quickly as far as Rome, and his disciples despised their own gods and worshipped Jesus as God. Now, that's completely from non-biblical sources, which sounds pretty good uh, substantiating evidence for the Bible. And again, it gets worse for the naturalist. Uh, the sun rises, uh, historical evidence for the resurrection. Again, there's an extra seven historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, empty tomb, post-mortem experiences, appearances, the origin of the disciples believe, uh, the, hypo the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead is the best explanation of these facts. And that hypothesis entails that God exists, which also entails naturalism is false. Again, already talked about that. Uh, New Testament is second to none as far as its literary scope. And yeah, uh, again, a lot of textualists like Dr. Daniel Wallace uh, is saying that the New Testament is beyond reliable as far as its quality and quantitatively. And again, you hear people like Bart Ehrman. I mean, he says, all right, let's debate. See who's got the information. And Bart, I actually like Bart Ehrman, but he takes things way out of context, almost to the point of telling kind of like a white lie. And again, he, he will say stuff like, well, this one says that there was uh, two people at the tomb. This one says there was one. So he says, if it's not inerrant, he can't trust it. And most historians aren't that way. As far, and, and first of all, all of these have good answers. Again, Mike Lacona, 700-page uh, book on just the historiography of the resurrection. Oh, Richard Carrier, William Lane Craig, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? Uh, N.T. Wright, John Dominique Crossan from the Jesus Seminar. Again, the Jesus Seminar is basically debunked now. They came saying, oh, we can't trust anything in the Bible. Well, they've been universally rejected. And, and it's only helped make the uh, historicity of the New Testament that much stronger. So again, internal consistency, historical accuracy, prophetic accuracy, and scientific accuracy, the Bible really does meet up on all of these, which is amazing if you really stop and think about it. So this gets us back to four options for historicity. Again, I'm not going to go all the way to the inerrancy route. Uh, we could talk about that. But as far as just secular academia, it is a maximalist document, which means it is of utmost accuracy and historic scope and explanatory scope and plausibility. And again, this part's funny uh, that Gary Habermas has actually talked about uh, even if a person said, take that last one, the worst one, book of fiction, and he says, you still have the minimal facts, which gives you, because uh, the Jesus Seminar, which said, oh, we got to reject all this, and like I said, they've been universally debunked, but even if you took what they gave you, it's enough to get you to Jesus' resurrection. So it's amazing that he's saying, even if you give the minimum, those minimum facts are so good that it still gets you to a resurrection. And again, naturalism of the gaps. That is constantly what I see when I talk to professors, when I talk to students, is it will always be just like this cartoon. Some math equations and then a huge missing spot, uh, something natural occurs. And again, like... I tell them, I think you should be a little more specific here in step two. So I think naturalism holistically is false. And again, I had to cram a lot in in two hours, but I hope you can at least start to kind of get your mind working around that. And uh, like I said, get the website, get the books, and um, tons of debates out there. Naturalism is false. Therefore, we should be open to have more of these dialogues, more of these debates. Uh, who was the historical Jesus? Did the resurrection happen? Again, watch these debates. Uh, they're free on YouTube. Uh, I've got a bunch on my site. Uh, did the resurrection happen? Great conversation between Gary Habermas and Anthony Flew. And Anthony Flew finally came around and said, you know what? 
He was the most notorious atheist, m much bigger and much more scholarly than, say, Richard Dawkins. And he finally wrote a book. He said, you know what? There is a God. Now, I don't think he went all the way to being a Christian, but he said, there's got to be a God. And he said, the Christian God is the most plausible. So I don't know what happened there. But, but we have nothing to fear. And plus, it would hopefully, being able to do more critical thinking and take the evidence where it goes, might actually help reverse some of this dumbing down of America. And again, great courses, which is no fan of uh, Christianity, uh, but they had a, a great little uh, cultural, cultural literacy for religion, everything the well-educated person should know. And even they made the point, great little course here, that uh, we should, we, we're so scared of religion now that we can't tell anything from a Sikh, from a, a Hindu, from a, a Muslim, you know, what does Christians really believe? Uh, so again, universities should be the top leading this, not the ones with their heads buried in the sand. And the last thing, uh, history of the world. Here's a good example of bad naturalism from a historian. J.M. Roberts, a renowned historian, just makes these wide circular assertions. And it'll be something like uh, 100,000 B.C. man discovers fire. And he, and, we, and if you ask him, he's just assuming, he immediately says, well, we just got to go to the scientist on this. And the science says it's naturalism. Well, that's false and false, I think. Take someone like Susan Bauer, uh, History of the Ancient World. She's got a big series on these. She treats this as a maximalist document. Not inerrant, but maximalist. And she, her history book is flawless. It's smooth. It makes sense. So again... If we take this more serious, then we've got nothing to fear. Above all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires, they will say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, God's word, the heaven came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. So again, this has a good amount of not just plausibility, but it's a better theory of everything. It encompasses everything. The way we see the world, the way we see the birds outside, uh, this beautiful day. And again, for the naturalist, it constantly gets worse, but I am actually beyond time. Beyond out of time. Arts, aesthetics, aesthetics. And again, this, this outdated uh, enlightenment, uh, Nietzsche-like uh, nihilism. Uh, God is dead. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of bad things happening with the war. Things changed. Uh, like I said, our art changed. And you can see this everywhere. And my point being with this slide is that a lot of people especially the youth, are having kind of this existential crisis. Like I talked about, like Anthony Bourdain uh, had everything and killed himself. And, and I think Christianity, and that's really also, I'm not, uh, I'm not just doing this from an academic level. Obviously, I believe it. So I really do want everyone to be saved. And I really do take that serious. And I think this existential crisis can be answered by a lot of those. And so if we can be of any help, my wife or I, or any of the members of Logos Research, I guarantee you, we would love to. We do have, like I said, the History Museum, but we also have a little art gallery. She has a coffee shop upstairs. This is one during our, one of our uh, featured artists. We've got a lot of good abstract work. It's not like it's all of, you know, Jesus and the prophets or anything. But let us buy you a coffee. Uh, go through some art. Maybe we'll host you. Again, we've got some good examples here. John Cage music, music by chance, kind of like Pollock music or painting by chance. So again, Christianity does have good answers from an aesthetic, emotional level, and also from an intellectual academic level. Again, I already told you the, uh, the history museum here. We've got a lot of the stuff I've covered, replicas of all the bulas. Uh, a lot of these are authentic artifacts. And again, a lot of the uh, examples of looking at some of the fossils, we've got Lucy, we've got a lot of this stuff. And like I said, trying to speed through these. Oh, and tons of free material. 
We have speakers periodically. And then lastly, we're looking at possibly a Labrie in Northwest Arkansas. Again, what's Labrie? Well, it's too long to go into. Ask me after it and uh, check out the website. So one part on the conclusion that I think is funny, I would show you the video, but I'm way out of time, is uh, Pin Gillette. Uh, if you YouTube Pin Gillette Bible, it'll come up, but he's hardcore atheist, and uh, somebody took a chance and gave him a Bible, and he actually made a podcast about how incredible that was. He said, I don't believe, he said, if you're a Christian, you have to be proselytizing. How much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? Uh, if you believe there's a heaven and hell and somebody might miss heaven or go to hell because it's socially awkward. And then he said to my atheist friends, he said, dude, no. He said, there's a certain point if a bus is coming down uh, the hill and it's about to run you over, I tackle you. And he said, this is even more important than that. Now, he still is an atheist, but he really understood the urgency. And that's kind of what I'm employing to you today as well. And I encourage you to watch. It's a great like a three, four minute video. And then uh, last month, I had the privilege of actually being able to see uh, Penn and Teller. And I did take a chance to go ahead and give him the ebook copy of my book. I mean, probably didn't read it. But it's, again, it was a little socially awkward, but it doesn't matter. I do believe uh, that Christianity is true. And that's why I implore you to at least think as well. And like I said, logosresearchassociates.org. Uh, we're here for you. And as you can see here, I really do think uh, it's not just a five-legged table. It's like a 20-legged table. And it really does come together beautifully. So with that, I thank you very much. And I apologize for going a little bit over. Uh, God bless. And actually, if you don't mind, you don't have to, but I'm just going to say a really quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I uh, do pray that, even though the presentation was a little bit choppy, that it was able to signify the points you wanted, and I pray that there will be some friendships made here, some contacts, and I pray that your truth will uh, flourish by your Spirit. You know all our names and needs in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's take a break, and then we will do Q&A. Thanks, guys.